record to the cloud recording in progress okay hello everyone this is the first session of the new center for research and practice seminar artistic methodology the parasitical turn this is the first seminar in an eight-part series that will feature presentations and discussions with the artists golden and Senebi, minerva cuevas jill magan christian yankovsky Chris Evans and Yannick Simon. So I'm, I'm Matthew Post and I'm an enthusiast, word processor and curator working under the name Post Brothers. I'm originally from LA. I grew up in Seattle. I, I studied in Vancouver and San Francisco. And now I live in a small village at the far east of Poland um, near a, a city called Białystok. Um, if you want, you could take a look at the, the new center. There, there's a, a more extensive bio. Um, the only thing that I would mention uh, about myself more at the moment is um, that I, uh, at the mo uh, at the moment, I'm working on an exhibition that will be happening in in Białystok that um, regards the history of of this city, where um, at the turn of the uh, the turn of the 20th century there was um, a massive um, kind of influx and and kind of a literally and figuratively a boom of uh, anarchist activity, insurrectionist anarchist activity. Um, here and given the the kind of politics of Poland today, um, which is heavily right wing and and very much in the midst of a culture war, um, this exhibition will certainly um, ruffle a few feathers and maybe get us in some trouble. And to connect uh, to connect to that, it also involves um, quite a bit of parasitical um, strategies and um, actions of of expropriation and other things. So maybe I'll just begin. Um, so in 2011, the curator Chris Fitzpatrick and I published a, a text in the Canadian journal Philip that was titled A Productive Irritant, Parasitical Inhabitations in Contemporary Art. And we were in, initially inspired by the French philosopher Michel Serres' um, 1980 book, The Parasite, which defines the parasite through three commonly held uh, perspectives of the term as biological, social, and communicative. And this is because uh, parasite is also the French word for noise, like the disturbance in a communication in a signal. So Serre's text discusses its namesake as a vehicle for introducing irritants to any given order, causing subtle changes that can be productive and cumulative. In the text, we looked at how certain artists have used parasitical operations as effective strategies for the manipulation of context introducing unsuspecting tactics, gleaning energy from unexpected places, and identifying weaknesses within seemingly taught and enclosed systems. So this uh, seminar will focus on artists who have operated as parasites by intruding into spaces where they are not welcome, parroting and, and inverting certain roles, systems, formats, contexts, and redistributing resources from one space to the next. The figure of the parasite extends to artists a means of surveying, articulating, questioning, and contaminating relations. It is a tool to determine loopholes, complicities, and power positions within any given system. Uh, consider how the hacker investigates their target and identifies exploits and loopholes through which they enter and extract information. Or consider how a prankster introduces the irrational or unexpected into normal activities. Or consider how the appropriation of a text or artwork can be both a critique and a celebration of its source that makes visible power relations and influences. The parasite here is, is not simply a means, uh, uh, simply a form of activism or culture jamming, as, as it used to be called, but a means to take advantage and exploit a system, demonstrating our own dependencies and assumptions regarding the world around us, as well as showing how su such systems are supported through our own actions and complicities. By invading channels of communication and interrupting social relations and the operations specifically of institutions, one can extract surplus, introduce unexpected elements, and force a system to evolve and adapt. So through these discussions with these artists, um, this seminar will examine a wide range of tactics for creative infiltration. And we'll consider what these acts tell us about how systems work today. The emphasis in this seminar is on tactics, not form. We will explore how parasites negotiate their surroundings and how their presence brings about responses in their chosen system. 
In order to survive, the parasite becomes an expert in their host's habits and a manipulator of its codes. Such efforts not only make visible a system's internal criteria, but also lay bare the parasitical interrelations within the system itself. So it's not just that the parasite is coming into a system and, and shaking it up, but also it's, it's, it's turning the tables and kind of identifying the quote unquote host as, as a parasite, as already part of a, a system of parasitical relations. So it's these relationships that, what, uh, that parasites feed on. Parasites exploit routines of exploitation. They interfere with perceived balances and legitimacies by deferring the normal route. So today I will give an introduction to Michel Serres thinking about this um, uh, around and through the parasite. And I'll, I'll just start kind of mentioning a number of different artists and projects from the past and present that I think um, is, is relevant. Um, I'm sure that, that most of you can also think of kind of parasitical actions within your own communities and, and, and other systems. And I, and, um, I, wel I, I welcome uh, some of these uh, for us to kind of begin to build a kind of larger kind of uh, canon of, a, of, of kind of parasitical actions. Um, so t today we'll begin by, uh, oh, sorry, here, I should share the screen like a professional. Um, just give me one second. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So, so today we'll, we'll begin by examining logics of inclusion and exclusion using the immunological ideology of the white cube within art context as a model for these larger dynamics. And we'll look at how artists have intruded into spaces where they're not welcome, from the gallery space to public space to the media space. Um, yeah, this is Gianni Modi uh, uh, appearing as a as a soccer player, as a football player on, on the field. Um, we'll also address issues of mimicry and the language and markers of authority and authenticity, reviewing a range of artists and activists who have appropriated and parodied the voice of power by exaggerating or faking expertise, forging documents, or changing their names. Um, we'll also encounter issues of, of, of unequal exchange, complicity, dependence, mimicry, over-identification, looking at instances where institutions invited the parasite in, where artists addressed the system from the inside or integrated their workings with already existing sociocultural systems, industry, or government. This seminar will, will consider how acts of resistance are often are also often co-opted and implicated in the very structures they seek to undermine. And we'll explore parasitical methods as acts of survival and subver uh, subversion in our kind of uh, crisis-filled world. Throughout, we'll also be considering the corrupted ethics of the parasite, um, how it interacts with certain systems and structures, how such actions replicate already parasitical relations, we we'll begin to measure the tenuous divide between antagonism, agonism, and complicity. The parasite is not only a means to take advantage of the exploiter system, but it's also a way to understand the hidden packs of hospitality and property within the cultural field and within economic, biological, and social political systems. Illuminating, and, and through this, we'll, we'll begin to look at our own kind of dependencies and assumptions regarding the world around us and about power positions. In this seminar, we will look at the parasitical strategies of the guest artists, as well as addressing the specific workings of the systems they interact with and intervene with. Um, in my final talk, I'll, I'll respond to a lot of the presentations directly, but we'll also try to consider how, I, I, I think in the final talk, we'll also be emphasizing how parasitical strategies have changed or developed in recent times. Um, I, I think that was a big question um, when I shared this original text with um, a number of the artists, they, they were really curious, like, like what, what type of changes have happened and what ways have parasitical maneuvers been co-opted by um, much more um, evil forces, such as systems of power, finance, and ecological destruction. So um, throughout, hopefully, our conversations will kind of constantly move between biological, economic, social, artistic, authoritative, legal, ta personal, tactical, insurrectional, and affirmative kind of positions. And um, so we'll be trying to kind of move between different um, 
uh, different kind of registers and different epistemologies. I imagine that some of you may have signed up for the course due to the parasite's invocation of uh, ecological principles, and that surely is, is there. Um, but we're not really going to be addressing interspecies relations too much, although I, th I think that that will play a huge role in our first two um, conversations with uh, Golden Sanabi and Minerva Cuevas. Um, and, um, and we'll use those kind of models for to, to look at how information flows and how different dynamics are present in human forms of interaction and power. I think often people get bogged down in demarcations of uh, mutualism, symbiosis, predation, and other kind of moralistic taxonomies of parasitic relations. But such divisions are of no use to Michel Serre. All relations, he says, are parasitical. Um, in his book, The Parasite, Serre investigates the appearance of parasitical activity in literature and science bridging the domains of biology, anthropology, and information theory to arrive at a conception of how systems operate more generally. His robust theory of the parasite offers no clear distinction between parasite and host. Each parasite is also a host. Each host is also a parasite. Humans are host to millions of different organisms that might be seen as parasitical, but we could be seen as parasitical ourselves on the planet and on these organisms, given the way that our actions, particularly under capitalism, are destroying whole species and ecosystems at an alarming rate. For Sarah, the, the critical question is not to distinguish who is the parasite from the, ho from the host, but to develop kind of new conceptual tools to name the relations of parasitism that interconnect not only multiple biological organisms at, um, and ecological systems, but also social relations, conceptual apparatus and political, economic and cultural institutions and structures. The parasite here is not merely a metaphor that migrates, it's a fundamental ontological condition based on the codependent transformation of energetic excess, of, of surplus, in, and, and taking that surplus and redirecting it into uh, structural and systemic change, and to be able to feed off of it. The, the parasite is the opportunistic beneficiary of surplus created by the host, but in the digestion of that surplus creates the conditions for the host's evolution and adaptation. So in this case, the parasite is, is the quintessential participant. Um, for historian William H. McNeil, however, it is a question of distribution. In his book, The Human Condition, he, he describes the history of civilization through microparasites, microorganisms, fungi, insects, small animals, mice and rats, and other organisms that, that live off of humans specifically. And he compares those micro or, uh, microparasites to macroparasites, which are humans who feed off the labor of others. He argues that in the course of human development, microparasites such as pests and disease have thrived by infesting dense populations, serving as a kind of means of population control. For McNeil, the development and circulation of microparasites and macroparasites serve not only to regulate and exploit surplus, but remain, in fact, the primary motivation between clashes of civilization. The development of surplus goods left humans open to macroparasites, to thieves, then warlords who levied, ta levied taxes in exchange for protection, shaving off the surplus while leaving enough behind for producers to continue. This process of parasitism evolved into vast div divisions of labor and value. So I think that, that that is one of the fundamental kind of questions that we'll be having is, is what are, are these kind of distributions of labor and value uh, through this? And particularly what, what, what is the kind of complicity um, that, that the different kind of operators within such systems um, play in maintaining those type of systems? The word parasite might, uh, might also bring to mind humans acting in a similar manner, trying to get more out of society than they give back. We could think of the greedy capitalists or lazy good for nothings, or how certain societies and regimes have labeled populations as parasites as a way of giving legitimacy to their status as outsiders and justifying their extermination. In social discord, the parasite is often used for a person who habitually lives at the expense of others. They're the bad guest, the social loafer who charms the way onto a host's dinner table and eats for free. Or rather, they are the one who makes an unequal exchange. They pay for their food by giving, by um, being entertaining, by giving, by, by exchanging 
uh, the solid of food for the kind of immaterial of of uh, words and uh, so social um, performance. Um, you know, and 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 if you look at someone like um, uh, Jacques Derrida, um, he he talks quite a bit about uh, hospitality, about this kind of uh, conjoined relationship of of the French hut, which means both guest and host in English. Um, and he and and Sarah also kind of balls at this kind of part part that the host and the guests are kind of constantly interrupting one another. They take from one another and they pay back one another in in different ways through different languages and through different kind of economies. Um, even even when the parasite seemingly gives nothing in return, the parasite is always an addition to a system. They, uh, Sarah writes that the parasite always adds a mediation. It increases the system's complexity. In other words, the parasite invents something new. Since it does not eat like everyone else, uh, else, it builds a new logic. The parasite changes whatever system it enters, and their interruption persuades. It does this by impelling the, uh, the parties it parasitizes to act in one of two ways. Either they incorporate the parasite into their midst, and thereby accept the new form of communication that the parasite has kind of imposed on this social situation, or they act together to expel the parasite and transform their own social practices in the course of doing so. So the diners collude to expel the uninvited guest, but here then is the origin of human relations, the struggle to either incorporate or expel the parasite. Um, in any communication or exchange, there are efforts to exclude the parasite, the interference, the third man, the intruder, the noise, and the signal. This is um, a, a graph that, that Michel Serres uh, Sarah used, which is a kind of undermining of Claude Shannon's idea of, of um, communication. Um, one example that Michel Serres uses is, is, is a phone call that happens in the midst of a dinner party. So at first, it, um, the phone call is this disturbance, it's a noise, an, an intrusion on the conversation at the table. But when you pick uh, up the phone, all of a sudden the table becomes the noise and the, the, um, the phone becomes the signal. So that kind of constant kind of um, uh, interplay between, between noise and signal, between nonsense and sense, um, is, is really um, part of kind of Michel Serres kind of thinking around uh, parasitical relations and, and their function as kind of um, noise in the background. Commu um, he says that communication is a f sort of game played by two interlocutors considered as united against the phenomena of interference and confusion or against individuals with some stake in interrupting communication. These interlocutors battle together against noise. There's no such thing as a clear interface or communication. There's always noise on the line. Systems are islands of ordered relations upon an ocean of noise. It's the pure multiplicity that serves as a background in all we do, the ground to our figure. In the process of developing this, this seminar series, I got, I got into a little bit of a dispute with, with the new center because <coughs> they wanted to describe it as a parasitical turn. Um, putting this theory into conversation with all those other turns that we can identify within theory and practice over the years. Um, the anthropological turn, the archival impulse, uh, the ecological turn. I mean, there's, there's lots of new material. I mean, there's lots of these kind of fads and, and different things. Um, while at the same time, I believe that artists have increasingly turned to parasitical strategies not, um, because of a kind of perceived impotence of binary antagonistic forms to affect change, and also as ways of carving out um, means of survival in a kind of um, horribly corrupt system, I, I I also feel that that you know um, you know that that the kind of crisis in which we are living in has also kind of um, uh, demanded that we begin to rethink about how our relations operate. And what type of kind of corrupt exchanges are happening even in our most kind of positive and most um, simplified um, situations. Um, Sarah's conceptualization of relationality is premised on one way relations it's um, it's not about like a, a, a mutual exchange where where what where food is exchanged for food. Um, in a world full of parasites there's no such thing as production. Nothing can be original since everything is immediately parasit uh, parasited. 
Sayers explains this idea by replacing Marx's concept, uh, concept of use value and exchange value with the term abuse value, which he defines as complete irrevocable consummation that only works in one direction. Abuse value uh, uh, precedes use and exchange value, according to Sayers, because exchange is always weighed, measured, calculated, taking into account a relation without exchange, an abusive relation. Through these abusive relations, the parasite creates a new logic. The typical understanding of exchange is that it must that that exchanges must be of the same order, for for example, food for food. But the parasite does something else. It can, for instance, show up as a guest, eat the food of the host, and give stories in exchange for the food. The parasite does not simply feed from the thing itself, but instead on the relation, on the on the social structure in which they're operating. And it has a relation to the relation. It's sitting on the channel of communication. I think a big question that will come up again, and again, and again um, uh, in this seminar uh, series is if parasitism, in this respect, is a form of resistance, a disturbance, an interruption, an overturning, an undermining, and a tangential turn from how systems are normally supposed to operate, or if, if the parasite is actually the base principle of all systems that it's something atomic at the core of all relations. Um, and certainly I think a, another big topic that we'll be um, returning to over and over is, is also all of the kind of parasitical relations that, that we understand um, within capitalism and other exchanges. Um, that, that, you know, the, the idea that, that people can profit um, from exchanges that you make between other people and the way, uh, the way that, that value is kind of extracted even when other forms of value are, are, are being exchanged. Um, you know, this, this type of kind of technocratic uh, capitalism that we've, that, that we've reached um, is very much about um, uh, weaponizing the parasite in a certain way. And, um, so I think I think that'll be a big kind of question throughout this entire series is um, is is the parasite um, an a act of resistance that like shakes up the system and 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 fights against it and carves out new ways of living and being together, or is the parasite actually a replication of the very systems that they're contesting? Um, is the is the parasite actually the 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 fundamental logic of 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 exploitation and 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 capitalism and artists are just uh pointing to it or referencing it or trying to kind of ride those those um that that kind of uh one-way direction uh, that chain of abuse value that happens in every exchange so I'm finally getting to artists and their relations to the institutions to which they work, but to get there, I want to use a meta metaphor of a conventional garden. Um, as I mentioned, I, I live in a small village. It's, it's like less than 100 people. Um, and, you know, the first act of gardening is clearing the space. It's like you wipe the, the slate clean. Um, it's the new beginning. It's the marking of the territory. The garden must be enclosed. The, the garden then has to be enclosed with a fence or walls, right? This is to signal who owns the domain, the land, the nest. This is mine because it is closed. Our garden is order and we will no, and, and will no longer be mine, will be less mine if it falls into a miserable state. And so, so there's this kind of, uh, uh, this idea that we must maintain uh, the, the garden to keep it. Um, it is closed, but it also must be open. It must have a gate, something that establishes who can come in and who can come out. Um, all of the organisms that used to be uh, live on the site are now treated as invaders. Native plants become weeds and animals and insects become pests. They become parasites that threaten the sanctity of the garden. The parasite must be chased away, repelled, pushed out, driven out, uprooted, dismissed, purged, and repressed. We repress what bothers us. This garden is somewhat of a body or the extension of the body proper. We know our bodies host millions of organisms that are not us, and we decide, consciously or not, which ones we are willing to host and which ones we prefer not to live on us. And this logic of immunization is what builds and maintains barriers between nature and culture, human and non-human, living and dead. This the sterilization of spaces to rid them of those things that we would prefer not to live with um, is, is fundamental to the kind of modern world. Um, like one, 
this uh, Italian philosopher and political theorist Roberto Esposito has has uh, a kind of theory of the immunization paradigm, um, which which is a kind of way of kind of looking at the dynamic of inside and outside within the modern world, and particularly within border regimes. Um, and 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 one thing that he warns about this is that this kind of this this um, this the, these attempts by the kind of body politic on the individual and collective body to kind of uh, to block itself off and to immunize itself from potential threats or contaminations and from others um, is is um, it uh, it risks negating life itself. Um, and today, of course, we are all acutely aware of how viral contamination and, and attempts to impose boundaries and restrictions are inextricably intertwined with other global processes, from the corrupted agroeconomic and ecological systems to the uneven development of uh, movement of people and resources from one place to the next. So the garden is, is both a kind of small enclave separated from the world and a symbol for the whole world all at once. We decide what we want to include and build barriers to expel what we don't, producing this kind of idealized space outside of context and particularity. And of course, one could consider the gallery space through the same logic. It's a site that was once a store or a warehouse or a room in an apartment or a, a, some sort of business. And most important, um, and, and it's been cleared of all its traces of past uses and occupants. You know, the floor is swept, the architecture is adjusted, lights are installed, and most importantly, the walls are painted white, you know, to, to signal this kind of sterilization. Um, this is what Brian O'Doherty called the ideology of the white cube. The white cube is to ensure the kind of presupposed ideal environment for the presentation of artworks. It has to be clean and discreet environment that reinforces the kind of abstraction of space and the decontextualization that's that's in the space. The white cube establishes this, this crucial dichotomy between what is to be kept outside, the social and the political, and that which is inside, this, the staying value of art. This gives the space a presence possessed by other spaces where conventions are preserved through the repetition of closed systems of value. Some of the, uh, some of the sanctity of the church, the formality of the courtroom, the mystique of the experimental laboratory joins with the chic design to, to produce a kind of unique chamber of aesthetics, the, the white cube. The whiteness of gallery spaces is the same as the whiteness of hospitals, right? It is a sterilized operating room whereby we can be more, where we can more clearly see stains, actions, or changes in conditions by instituting this kind of neutral frame where we kind of determine what, what is allowed in here and what is not allowed in here. So, Yet, like the garden, the gallery or museum are dependent on flows of bodies and materials, and, and, and particularly the gallery and the museum are, are dependent on both their, their, their function as a closed and isolated and sterilized space and their necessary publicness. You know, it, it has to be still available to at least to some people. Um, and a good example of this would be um, uh, in 1969, the, the artist Harvey Stromberg, uh, walked into the uh, the MoMA in New York with a notebook, measuring tape, and a camera, and he posed as a regular student, regularly um, coming coming in there. And he would kind of he would pretend to, to study the museum's collection, but in fact he was actually measuring and 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 photographing uh, different features within the architectural space of the MoMA itself. Um, so later that year, after printing over 300 uh, um, photographs of light switches, keyholes, bricks, air vents, and so on, he printed the, the photos at one-to-one -one scale and installed them throughout the, um, uh, throughout the museum. Um, you know, at, at different times, apparently, so, sometimes museum employees would notice this and they would take these, uh, take these kind of like fake uh, uh, light fixtures and, and, and bricks and throw them away. But um, he was never caught for this. And after, after about two years, he decided to finally claim ownership for the work um, because he wanted people to be aware that there are conflicts between museums and artists, namely around who is allowed to exhibit and who is not. And by humorously inserting his own work directly into the interior and exterior of the museum, Stromberg confused what the institution had sanctioned and what it had not. To, and he also, um, in, 
incorporated his work into the kind of neutral background of the exhibition space as a site of, uh, of, of intervention. One thing that I think that we'll see over and over um, today and, and, and through the artist presentations is, is that, um, that, that parasitical actions are often um, placing themselves into the background. They're, they're, they're really trying to occupy these kind of spaces of, of a, uh, where attention is not given and these kind of spaces that are, that are seemingly neutral. Um, you know, key, key to Stromberg's gesture was the fact that he walked in the front door, right? Um, he used the logic of publicness integral to the institution as a cover for his kind of nefarious inhabitation. Um, another intruder that, that we wrote about in, in the text um, is a Puerto Rican artist, Rafael Ferrer. Um, and in uh, 1968, he, he kind of disrupted the neat numerical order of, of this iconic anti-form exhibition that was called Nine at Castelli. Um, so the show was held in this, at the time, a, a quite an unusual location. It was actually uh, between three different uh, in, uh, spaces, but it was in this warehouse. And then it had also had um, this other gallery in there. Um, but essentially like, um, you know, the, the exhibition was organized by the artist, Robert Morris, who was kind of using the exhibition as a kind of thesis statement of his kind of anti-form kind of um, writings that he had been doing at the time. And um, and you know the 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 point of of Robert Morris uh, doing this was was he was trying to kind of emphasize that sculptural form should be derived from the inherent qualities of the chosen material, emphasizing kind of indeterminacy, chance, gravity, piling, stacking, hanging, and disordered and temporary arrangements, rather than just rigid structures or geometric shapes. So although Rafael Ferrer knew Morris and he was and and he, his work was perfectly in line with with the kind of anti form theses that Morris was trying to propose, he wasn't invited, but he saw the the um, the this opportunity uh, of the exhibition to be able to stage one of his work. Um, it's important to also recognize that that given the fact that Ferrer, I mean, Ferrer was was a a relatively well-known artist at the time and part of the kind of art community at the time but um you know many many people have speculated that that parts of parts of the reason why he wasn't um acknowledged within this was that you know he wasn't white and he was from puerto rico so like logics of, of racism and colonialism were, were certainly kind of playing a part so so instead, what what Ferrer did was that he, um, with the assistance of of three of his students, he went from um, he he uh, collected eighty seven large trash bags full of uh, dry leaves in Philadelphia, and then they they went to New York, and then they they would um, go into the different exhibition space and spill the leaves. Um, the, instru uh, the instructions that he gave to his assistants were to avoid becoming a spectacle and deposit the leaves anonymously, avoid interaction with the public, leave the area qu uh, quickly, and if confronted by resistance, move fast to repeat Philadelphia Leaves, which is the title of the work. Um, so in this case, uh, f you know, by inserting his work into these spaces, Ferrer tapped not only into the context of the exhibition itself. I mean, he was he was adding another kind of contribution that was completely relating to the very thesis of of, of the exhibition. But he also um, used his own exclusion as a way uh, as a way to be able to to kind of extract um, the kind of uh, the spotlight that the exhibition was was providing for the other artists. So. So in, in this case, not only did he in, intervene to these things, but he also was able to kind of gain um, uh, uh, public attention for his practice in return. And, you know, apparently because of the, these actions, he was finally began to be um, recognized. And so he was he was later in Documenta. He was he ended up getting uh, pulled into um, uh, When Attitudes Become Form, this iconic exhibition by um, Harold Jimen. 
So, so in, in many ways, uh, uh, Ferrer kind of used his kind of exclusion as an opportunity to be able to, to come in. And, you know, by, by kind of adding to the thesis and actually making uh, Morse's thesis more complex, he, he was adding to this kind of system and this kind of discourse, while at the same time um, recognizing his own ex- exclusion from it and getting, his, getting all, of the stu- all of the good stuff out of the show and none of the bad. Um, you know, and, and this is one of them at, as there. Um, I mean, it was really funny because it was also kind of, um, uh, it was also kind of form of mimicry. It's like when they, when they arrived in this, um, uh, in one of the other exhibition spaces, uh, it was uh, related to Duan uh, Gallery. Um, it was, it was a um, Cy Twombly exhibition. And, and when they, they threw all these leaves around, um, you know, the gallery attendant was like, oh no, you've, you've, you've brought the work to the wrong show. <laughs> and so, I mean, they're very much playing off of like that you're in the wrong place and you're in the right place at the same time. And very much kind of trying to kind of um, queer these kind of distinctions between inside and outside and what is kind of uh, um, allowed into the show and what is not. Um, you know, another example of an artist who uh, who we speak about in the in the text as well, who who would kind of um, invade ex, uh, other exhibitions was uh, Polish Romanian artist Andrzej Kadera, and he he was known for inserting these stick sculptures that you can see that him holding there um, into unwanted exhibition spaces, pro- provoking his peers by kind of sculpture bombing these uh, their space, and. Um, for him, it was it was very much a, about the fact that that these he believed that these objects um, he called he called them bars bars de boy rond like so round round bo- sorry my my French is really bad but but bars of 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 rounded pieces <laughs> but um, they're these cylindrical wooden rods of different lengths and he would carry these around with him all the time um, and so like f- for him. He 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 was very much trying to kind of question, um, like, what 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 are the kind of appropriate conditions for the display of his objects? And he he very much was trying to kind of um, it, for for him, galleries were not sites of display, but systems of power to be subvert uh, subverted. Um, so his his exhibitions in his, in his mentality was therefore they would take place whenever, wherever, and, and however he wanted them to uh, occur, including within other people's exhibitions. Um, at one point, his, his presence started getting really quite known as somebody. And um, Daniel Birnbaum wrote um, that in 1973 opening, uh, Kadera anticipated that he would be prevented from bringing a large bar into the gallery. And so he hit a very small second rod in his pocket. So when uh, when the host uh, tried to kick him out after being denied en- entry with the larger work, he snuck in without it and then snuck his kind of miniature version into the exhibition space. So every kind of attempt that was trying to kind of block him to these spaces, um, he would do. Another um, example of, the, uh, of, of, of this was um, in, in, in 1970, um, oh wait, yeah, yeah, in, ni- in 1970, the, there was... Um, there's Documenta Five, which was was uh, being curated also by Harold Jeman, this kind of mega curator of the time, um, maybe one of the first kind of authorial curators. Um, but um, <clears throat> you know, Jeman found out about this and and thought that it would be really cute to have this Romanian artist kind of walk with his walk walk from Paris to to Germany with um with with one of his works. Um, as as a kind of reversal of um, uh, a purported story from World War One, where Brancusi had walked from Germany to Paris, um, so so Jimin had this like beautiful kind of thought for the kind of uh, parasitical infiltration of of um, of Andre Kader's work, but. Um, so he invited uh, uh, Andre Kader to do this, and Andre Kader was like, "No, I'm going to take the train. I don't, I don't want to do this. At, uh, I, I don't want to do it the way that you're that you're imposing it on me. My my work has its own kind of situation. It 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 doesn't matter." And um, at at that point, uh, Harold Jimin kicked him out of the show, and of course, he showed up with it <laughs> because that's that's how he is. So it's like he he. 
being invited as a parasite, he he was not willing to take that. So instead, he 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 waited until he was disinvited to then um, come into this. Um, you know, I, get, I I imagine that in a, a number of your communities that you have you have artists and other people who are the same. Um, in in Vilnius, which is just a few hours away from here, there was there was an artist who was regularly showing up at exhibition openings um, with his own artwork. So he would wear an artwork and 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 he would kind of um, respond to the exhibition's themes in 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 weird ways. And people really hated this. They they thought that it was like a total nuisance and a real kind of like self um, aggrandizing kind of gesture. But um, I always thought that it was nice. I was always excited. Like I, I've done a number of exhibitions there, and I was kind of waiting to see like how he would respond to uh, the condition of the exhibitions that we had put together. So it's um it's very much about uh, whether or not um how how um how these kind of power dynamics ha happen when people are being kind of um, uh, asked to come in and and what kind of ways of people will like the par the parasite uses the kind of platform the public platform of the exhibition space as as a possibility to be able to kind of further their own works um, and often that that type of that type of action is also a way of critiquing the exhibition itself. Um, we could think of numerous actions at museums and other institutions uh, in recent times, whereby the professed openness of the site is set into conflict with the kind of exclusionary logics and hidden ideological and 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 white supremacist uh, operations within the museum. I mean, you could do an entire seminar series on such interventions into into uh, gallery spaces and museums, but um, I I just wanted to mention that one recent artwork that I think needs to be uh, spoken about a little bit is, is Parker Bright's protest of Dana Schultz's disgraceful reaffirmation of white violence and exploitation of black suffering and death. So after, after um, Bright saw this gruesome painting of the murdered child uh, Emmett Till's casket at the preview of the 2017 Whitney Biennial, the artist came back the next day as, as a visitor and uh, took off his jacket and, uh, um, and, and stood in front of the work wearing a shirt that said Black Death Spectacle as a way of both um, identifying that this, that this was a, uh, as, as a form of protest, but also as a way of kind of blocking the work. Um, I think that that blocking is really important. And, what, and, and here, the art, um, Bright's direct action parasitically used the public entry the, the the logic of the public entry of of the Whitney, um, and he used that to be able to call the artist, the artwork, and the institution to account for their profiting on black death. So, so it, it's not just that he was acting as a kind of parasite to to the kind of platform of this or of just like enacting a protest, but he was also kind of calling out everybody on from 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 this horrible painter to the um to the inst to the curator to the institution that they are all kind of parasitizing and 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 um yeah um they're parasitizing and profiting on black death and so um so here bright is demonstrating sarah's dictum that the parasite parasites parasitizes the parasites by blocking the work he did not not only did he not like censor the piece, but rather he kind of weaponized his viewership. He he weaponized his 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 stake not just as an artist, but also as a viewer. Um, I think that that's very important. Oh, wait, what's what's going on here? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, there we go. Um, so in addition to, to moments where artists kind of sneak into spaces of exhibition, we could think of dozens of times where artists has closed galleries. Um, among the more explicit artistic practices that dealt with the theme are uh, Daniel Biren uh, blockading his own exhibition in, in Milan, Robert Berry uh, um, emptying out the, uh, the, the, the gallery and putting up a sign saying that the gallery was closed, and Gustav Metzger's self-initiated art strike that was between 1977 and 1980. Um, more contemporary examples are Lori Parsons' 1990 solo show that was announced with an invitation, on which the only address of the that which only the address of the gallery was printed, so so nobody knew the date or the time or even that it was her show. Um, 
and uh, Santiago Sierra, which which is here in the the Leeson Gallery in, in 2002, where the entire gallery was covered in corrugated metal that made it impossible to enter. Um, my favorite ver uh, version of of an artist kind of blocking the kind of flow of people and information in uh, in and out of an exhibition space is uh, Graciela Carnavale, who is a, a, a Argentinian artist. She did um, uh, Ac Acción del Encierro, which is a lockup action in 1968. And so for this uh, for, for this work, the artist invited people to the opening of an exhibition. And once everybody was inside the venue, she padlocked the door and she left. Um, eventually, people t started trying to leave. <laughs> After about an hour, they realized that they were locked into there. And it created this kind of, um, it, it, the piece manifested through the kind of viewer's emotional and physical response to this imprisonment. And of course, this this imprisonment that she was imposing was, of course, a um, an analog for the Argentinian military uh, government um, for how they were kind of also imprisoning and abusing people within that time. But at the same time, it was also using the the exhibition space as a gesture, um, and and of closing this. Um, yeah, so that's they smashed the windows and climbed out, which is really nice. Um, a few years ago, um, the German artist Maria Eichhorn, um, she, I, I, I guess it was recently announced that she will be um, the German uh, contribution for the Venice Biennial, um, the next one. Um, but she did a, uh, she did a work called uh, Five Weeks, 25 Days, 125 Hours at London's Chisholm Hill Gallery. So for the show, she chose to ch close the gallery for the entire duration of, of the exhibition essentially giving a large part of the staff a five week paid vac paid vacation and automatically deleting all emails during that time. While this was marketed as a kind of gesture that gave back to the staff, I, I don't I don't really believe it in that case. And and, and it's, it's not really a recognition of their labor. It kind of like leaves their relationships intact. Um, it ended up not being much of a strike and more of a vacation, just a, a time off. And it's not like everybody didn't it's like, yeah, the, the emails were being erased, but but of course um, they still had the anxiety and the planning to, to deal with whatever was supposed to come after the exhibition. Um, so, so, so here it was like her gesture, her radical gesture that was kind of trying to kind of claim solidarity with the wage labor of, of the people working within the institution um, was kind of pl playing off like, like a kind of, a savior or like a benevolent employer who says, oh, take the rest of the week off, you know, this, this type of thing. So rather than questioning the parameters of work, time and labor in the institution itself, it, it um, and, and, and it also like missed the kind of questioning the exploitative relations of power and money that supports such a place. Well, this rechanneled the resources of the, uh, of, of the exhibition space, its temporariness and this kind of facile solidarity makes it less parasitical and more a celebration of the gallery's logic of excess and exploited labor. Um, it actually just reaffirms its, it, it, its logic as, as, as a form of exclusion. I mean, the public were refused entry, the team took a break, but their inherent relations between them were still left untouched. So this is, this is um, one big question that I think we'll be, we'll be questioning about lots of the, the kind of artists that, that I mentioned and, and lots of the projects that, that will be presented over the, the next weeks um, will be like, did the inherent relations actually change? And was, was, um, were, were, and, and was that change of relationships something that was beneficiary or necessary, or was it just a kind of uh, uh, a kind of temporary gesture that um, gives nobody anything? Um, so I think we could maybe move on to um, uh, out into the world and consider some artists who have used kind of public space to enact their works. I mean, of course, one of the most iconic is is that in the early 1970s, the artist and philosopher Adrian Piper did a series of performances that she called uh, Catalyst, because a after her ability to kind of catalyze and af uh, 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 or affect audiences. So in many of these um, catalysts, uh, 
yeah I, I could even say this it's like like a catalyst one she saturated a set of clothing um in a mixture of vinegar and eggs and milk and cod liver oil for weeks and then she would wear them out on the subway uh during evening rush hour just being this kind of stinky mess um uh walking around in public space in catalyst three she painted some clothing with sticky white paint and wore a sign that that, that said attached wet paint and then she went shopping at a department store for some gloves and sunglasses. Um, in Catalyst 4, she dressed very conservatively, but stuffed a large red bath towel in the side of her mouth until her cheeks uh, bulged to about twice the normal size, letting the rest of it hang down her the front. And, and then she would just ride on the buses and she went on, on the Empire State Building elevator. So she was kind of creating herself as a kind of catalyst, as a kind of public nuisance, as a kind of uh, stranger. Out, out, out in the world, um, you know, I mean, her and her body weren't convenient. They were as much of a contradiction and logical inconvenience as they were kind of obscene through through her kind of way of moving around. And in many ways, but for for the people that were actually like on the bus, you know, she was just a kind of weirdo. The weirdo in the city of New York is is not so surprising, but her her. Piper and her body became this kind of new benchmark, a kind of metric for 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 what could exist within the understanding of kind of an ordinary person and ordinary kind of behavior and 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 and, and activity. So I mean, the the common factor through all these uh, catalyst works was that Piper's appearance was as this kind of generalized oddball, this kind of outcast, this kind of. Um, this kind of uh, uh, contamination into the kind of social order and and breaking the kind of rules of, of kind of spaces. Um, but a few years later, um, in 1973, she began testing what would happen if she introduced into the public a far more specific identity, which was mostly based off of preconceived ideas and stereotypes. So this was the mythic being, as she called her character, who was a young black or Latino man with a mustache and an afro who smoked, wore shades, and exuded this kind of aggressive masculine persona, interrupting and exaggerating all these kind of deep-seated uh, yet unacknowledged fears and stereotypes of young minority men in public space. And so when she was in this persona, she would hold monologues with herself and she would like repeat diary entries of, of her own. And whenever somebody would pass, she would then also direct this monologue at the people to, to kind of add upon this kind of aggression. Um, so just as we are all constantly at odds with our kind of personal identifications and the learned indoctrinated regimes in which we operate, Piper stages identity as a kind of parasite. It's foreign to the host she occupies. She's both within and outside the culture which she has been made to inhabit and both within and outside herself. Like Kadira's propensity for public display, her character would appear in culture related locales like galleries and openings and concerts, but also on the streets or in public transportation. Um, and and these these type of you know um, this mythic being she 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 played with for for quite some time and at one point uh, yeah she would like sit around and smoke and catcall women um, I mean but but one of the most interesting kind of um, instances of this was that between 1973 and 1975 um, she she would uh, publish these advertisements in the in the classifieds. Um, uh, that where whereby you would have the mythic being uh yeah that would be um kind of it would be the same image of the mythic being and then um each would kind of have a thought bubble containing a, a different brief kind of dated passages from her from her own personal diary so in this case she's also like using the public space of the of the village voice and 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 of this kind uh, of this kind of public economy as a way of also kind of um airing her kind of personal personal experiences and um, this kind of discordance and the kind of weirdness of, I mean, particularly at the time for this type of um, um, uh, these type of images and these type of words to be existing within a newspaper um, or a weekly um, was, was very much a part of kind of develop, uh, developing kind of this, this, um, this regularized kind of uh, 
this kind of parasitical intervention of kind of like both taking the public space and turning it private and taking private space and turning it public and 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 putting the kind of stranger out into a uh, stranger both as as a form as a as a stereotypical character but also the stranger as 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 also the form of of this kind of comic book uh comic strip like uh communication within the kind of language of advertising um and and i think that this that her kind of um her role of the catalyst works and as as the mythic being was very much about trying to 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 maintain herself as a kind of uh, as a public nuisance um for jean luc nancy is crucial that that these type of relationships are o that parasite to host relationships are always content uh, contentious he says that's that 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 intruder enters into its host by force, surprise, or cunning, in any case, without any right to do so and without invitation. Um, one, one thing that I, uh, another kind of version of this that I think um, uh, Andrea, uh, sorry, um, Adrian Piper has used um, is that that she would often, um, uh, uh, as, as a woman with mixed racial heritage, she would, um, she would often be very aware of the ways that she passed and 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 how people perceived her within different spaces. Um, so um, she did this kind of uh, regular project. I think it's even still kind of ongoing. But um, in her calling card, she would hand out this card that she, uh, if she heard people saying uh, racist remarks, that would say like, "Dear friend, I'm black. <laughs> I'm sorry to make you uncomfortable, but uh, I, I am uncomfortable by the way that you're acting." So it's very much um, about kind of circulating this. An another one was if she was at a bar and somebody came to proposition her, uh, she would hand hand the card to people and be like, "Hey." As a woman, I'm allowed to be here alone, and I came here alone, and I'm not looking for any uh, any other company. So it's very much about kind of um, uh, I mean, th this is kind of what what is the kind of the horror of of Adrian Piper's um, artistic practice, because her philosophy is also something worth um, looking further into. But the the core of her pro project is very much about the transferring of agency. Of obligations and responsibilities and 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 recognition from her to us. So th so the viewer or the per uh, person who is handed this card, she has uh, um, called them out and 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 transferred this kind of um, power. And in many ways, um, by getting us to react, by by asking us to kind of um, uh, to to play into this kind of things, it, it prompts prompts uh, people to not just to reflect, but to also recognize their kind of distinctions and their relationships. Um, and and her artworks, I mean, some some critics have said that that um, that her works are like castigating lectures. But I, I, I believe that there are these kind of very generous kind of actions that are very much about kind of um, uh, bringing the participant in um, for the for in the same way that the that that people encountering the mythic being or or her with a with a a, a towel in her mouth um, were were kind of brought in um, they, they were kind of they, they were outside of the game but they were also brought into the game like the work was not um, Adrian Piper doing these things the work was people's reactions the affect that it had onto them and the kind of perceptions and and imaginations that happened in their minds and um, behavior at the time. So given, given the racial politics and the use of public space, we, we can also see a similarity to the artist Lorraine O'Grady, um, who had this um, persona in the 80s that was called um, Mademoiselle Bourgeois Noir, which, was, uh, um, which she developed as a critique of the racial apartheid still prevailing in the mainstream art world. So for the work, um, uh, Grady made a dress out of 180 white gloves and would don this dress, a sash and a crown, while embarking on guerrilla performances in New York, giving, quote, timid black artists and thoughtless white institutions each a piece of her mind. So her first invasion of an art opening uh, unannounced was at just above Man Midtown, which was a, a important black avant-garde gallery in the 1980s. Um, but her second was when she she went to the uh, to the to the very beginning opening of the new museum of contemporary art in 1981, where she wore the costume. This is the picture, and she also carried a cat of nine tails whip, 
uh, made from rope and white chrysanthemums. And after clearing some space amidst the crowd, she started to whip herself. And, um, and she, she would say that it was the whip that made plantations move. And so, so for O'Grady, what, what's kind of interesting is beyond her kind of guerrilla invasion of art spaces and, 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 and kind of uh, undermining the kind of typical decorum that you're supposed to have within such spaces, um, it was all, like um, Mille uh, Bourgeois Nura was, was a state of mind for her even when she wasn't in costume and sometimes she would just pin one of the uh one of the gloves on her clothes um she she would kind of um it, it would it would give her kind of um a, a political aspect and it would be a kind of marker to other people that she was also playing this kind of character that she was inhabiting this character it's um it's there's a sense of drag an exaggeration of bodily performance and it's a parasitic intervention into social convention but it's also this intrusive reminder of power relations within such spaces through her kind of estranged occupation of shared space. So it's like she was she was both a guest and a stranger in this context. Yeah, that's her whipping herself. Um, yeah, quite the performance. Um, I'm glad that uh, O'Grady is finally getting some due because she was kind of um, rendered in obscurity for the last uh, 30 years, I think. Um, in contrast, um, uh, you know, dressing up can give. So, so while well, uh, Lorraine O'Grady, through her kind of uh, through this persona and this dressing up, she was able to mark herself um, uh, as a stranger in the similar way that Adrian Piper was able to. Um, at other times, parasitical artists will will use camouflage and and clothing as a as a particular way to kind of mimic the system's habits and 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 uh, to be able to sneak into places that they weren't allowed. So um, this is from a, a classic um, intervention in 1950 in, in Paris, where um, the, this lettrist artist, um, uh, Michel Mouret, he, um, he dressed up as a Dominican friar and then wrangled his way onto the altar at the Notre Dame Cathedral. And he delivered a sermon on live TV condemning the church. So in this case, he, he was also like, you know, he, he, it's about like sneaking in, looking the part, and then giving a kind of counter message. Um, very kind of simplified, uh, a parasitical gesture. Um, as, as, Sarah, uh, as Michel Serres explains, by secreting a tissue identical to the host, some bi biological parasites neutralize the host system's standard mechanisms for rejecting the potential threats posed by foreign bodies. By making the host think that it is cut from the same cloth and then incrementally revealing itself, the parasite stuns the host's usual defenses. By the time the host realizes that it has been hijacked, it's too late. The parasitized, the, the parasited, abused, and cheated body no longer reacts. It accepts it. It acts as if the visitor were its own organ. It consents to maintain it. It bends to its demands. The interloping uh, parasite plays its environment. It plays a game of mimicry. It it plays at being the same, and and this is very much part of it. I mean, an another great example of 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 dressing and 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 playing the part and trying to kind of, of the parasite also playing this game of mim mimicry is um, Pilvi Tikala's work, Real Snow White. And here, the absurd logic of the real character and the extreme uh, discipline of Disneyland became apparent when a real fan of Disney's Snow White was banned from entering the park in a Snow White costume. So she showed up to, uh, to I guess this is uh, Euro Disney, and she, um, she, she stood in front and she was in perfect costume. And, and, and you know, um, visitors, uh, visitors at Disneyland are encouraged to dress up and a lot of costume like merchandise is sold at the park but only full uh, but full costumes are not allowed to be sold within there um they're only sold for children um that the kind of anything even slightly out of the control of 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 Disney immediately kind of evokes fear of these real possibly dark and perverse dreams coming true so so she playing the part of the innocent Snow White shows up to be there and everybody's wanting to meet Snow White. But the security guards went crazy because they were they were they were sure that that she was an unauthorized character and an unreal real Snow White that was kind of uh, proliferating within the space. 
and um, their the security guards and, and management's negotiation of her, um, and 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 trying to uh, and them kind of explaining why she's not allowed to enter uh, formed a, a, a video work of 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 hers where she she really kind of um, shows the kind of hypocrisy of the space and like what what type of uh, visuals and what type of bodies are allowed to be in here and how these costumes are allowed. Uh, it's only, uh, uh, you know, corporately sanctioned costumes that are allowed to, to exist within this context. Um, another great instance of how a costume changes one's willingness to accept you within a space is uh, Ahmet Agut. He did this um, project in 2008 called Hitchhiking General. And um, this was for a show where, where the entire staff of the Malmo Kunsthalle um, hitchhiked on behalf of different artists. And in this case, it was the, the artist uh, Olaf Olofsson wore a kind of standard suit of a Swedish general, and he started uh, hitchhiking. And whenever uh, someone stopped off or arrived, he suggested that they place the two small flags on the front bonnet of the car, just like flags on official cars. So this orchestrated situation displaces the position of power and demands participation. In a general's costume, the hitchhiker is no longer just a stranger who needs to be transported from one place to another. He becomes a kind of strategic symbol that is hard to refuse or ignore by people passing by. One of the most interesting outcomes of this idea is that the audience who on those days drove by, uh, drove by him didn't have that much time to think about it, right? And so they, um, they had like just this like fraction of a of a minute to to um to decide whether or not they should pick up the general and you know and 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 at that point they would never kind of find out if the general was real or not if they if they didn't pick it up uh pick him up you know so th this kind of moment of fleeting potential is is the work it's not necessarily like the riding with the general or, or an artist pretending to be a general it's 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 the kind of absurdity of 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 within a kind of, um you know you you expect a certain kind of person uh, a, a teenager with a backpack and instead you have a, a swedish army general and all of a sudden you have have all these kind of um um, uh, flips and, and, and context, but but the really when when Akud talks about the work, you know the, the real work was not the people who picked the um, picked up the general. It was it was the work, the, the real work was people driving by and deciding not to pick up the general, right? Um, so the, again, like this this um, this concept of of whether or not to incorporate the or expel the parasite and to decide whether or not something is safe or not um, is. Uh, very much was then infiltrated into the kind of idea of hitchhiking and of the nation state in this context. Um, yeah, you know, a more subtle gesture is is Jonathan Monk's waiting for famous people. So in, in in here, the artist would show up at airports and he would he would stand around with with a sign, and it would just it would create. I mean, it, it was great because sometimes uh, the people were dead, like Sigmund Freud, and and or Leo Castelli. And so you would you would never kind of know you know at, it, it, you know the the work was really not for his own kind of benefit nor was uh, nor was it for somebody coming out but it was also for uh, the the work was kind of um, was targeted at the other people who were waiting around who would then have this kind of um, this feeling that that at any time this kind of famous person um, from Kurt Cobain to Marcel Duchamp or or Godot, you know, of course, um, uh, we're going to come come in and uh, arrive, you know, so you have these kind of like public infiltrations that are using the kind of these kind of basic logics. Um, you know, ex another example is like Francis Elise, who has done works that intervene in public spaces and in one he appeared as as a tourist uh, among day laborers, so you could buy the tourist. Um, well, and 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 another work. Oh, I don't, I don't have the video, but yeah. So he he would do these type of things. Um, I think another artist that that's interesting in in terms of 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 kind of being an alien within a, a certain setting and 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 using certain codes to be able to infiltrate those systems is uh, the Italian-born uh, Swiss artist Gianni Modi, who enters into generic scenarios outside the confines of art, including public events, political proceedings, and mass media. Um, and you know his his work is really the kind of structural analysis of his host that that then is able to 
you know, he has to do a lot of kind of um, a reconnaissance to, to identify this. So, so in, in, in this case, like in 1995, he emerged on a professional soccer, uh, football field alongside players, warmed up with the athletes and took a seat on, on one of the, the team's benches. Um, and it was completely unnoticed parasitical action, but at the same time, it was witnessed by thousands of, of spectators and seen by people all over television and on the newspaper. Like a white cube, the, the football pitch is a, is, a, is a delineated zone for a limited group of approved agents to act according to certain rules. So by kind of wearing the uniform, he's able to, to enter into these spaces. Um, by simply appearing, Modi broke both of the rules of who may appear and the sovereignty of, of that domain. Um, you know, I mean, Modi is much more, I mean, another, another example is, is, is in, he, he would like claim, like for a marathon, he claimed a space so that everybody who, who won, it was like right by the finish line. So every time somebody won, they still had to go through Modi's space. So it was very much about like trying to use the like logic of, 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 of this event to also be able to kind of mark his own territory in that sense. Um, another uh, another series of works that he did was was where he would um, uh, claim response. He would send out press releases and claim responsibilities for natural and unnatural disasters. So like an earthquake would happen, and he would he would he would be like, "Oh, sorry, it was it was my fault," <laughs> you know. And um, and, and, and another uh, another great one was was um, yeah, he took responsibility for the Challenger disaster and and things like that. And it's kind of it's a weird kind of thing because it's like he takes the responsibility but then he's also like uh, benefiting from from this um from the kind of uh notoriety that such such a responsibility would give him um you know probably his his i i'd say his his most effective work was was he was uh, attending the the a session at, at at the commission on human rights in geneva and he noticed that there was a vacant seat reserved for the indonesia's delegate and 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 uh, so instead, he he uh, he snuck it into the table and sat at the Indonesian's delegate uh, space and started voting alongside all the other uh, Human Rights Commission members. And when the time came to vote on on a resolution concerning ethnic minorities, Modi rose up and, and made a speech on ethnic division, aesthetics, and human rights. And so, um, and 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 um, representatives of Indigenous America, uh, Americans and other ethnic groups who were part of this resolution, they all like stood up and rallied to the words of the Indonesian delegate and walked out of the assembly in solidarity with his position. So here he sees that that there's a there, there's a seat at the table that's not being used, and he comes and occupies that, and 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 um, and takes the responsibility on a political and personal level. You know, I mean, in, in his quest for, I mean, probably his most famous famous kind of infiltration was um, was that he he uh, it was it was during the French Open uh, uh, tennis championship, and apparently George W. Bush was was at the event, and so I mean, in a very kind of activist kind of way, he he um, he made sure that he sat. Um, where where all the live television cameras were were looking at, and he wore this uh, yellow uh, <laughs> yellow bo uh, bag over his head as a as as a reference to the controversial images of of prisoners um, uh, who were tortured at Abu Ghraib. So um, you know he he does he he has this kind of, he's using the kind of the media and these kind of spaces of of, of media and uh, and 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 um, and knowledge and and using that as a kind of site for his work um like an, another thing was that he um he he printed out all these these um assistant he would he would commission all these kind of assistants and he was he was trying to spread his um uh these t-shirts that would identify assistants to all types of um political activists and 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 artists and other people and so so there's like an entire i mean there's an entire archive of people wearing johnny modi assistant shirts so he's kind of like he's piggybacking on the kind of um struggles of others and their kind of activity um uh around around the world um and but probably my favorite 
uh, uh, Gianni Modi kind of project was that for a week in, in, in 2000, the more kind of sensitive readers of the Swiss newspaper, Neue uh, Lusener uh, Zeitung, they began to notice this kind of weird character. And, and what he did was that he followed around the press photographers for this newspaper, and he would just like time himself so that he would just walk into the frame at every shot. So here he is sitting in, in some sort of conference. Here's another one, you know, and so like, after a while, after like a few days of this, people really started noticing that he was just in every picture in the background, just appearing as this kind of weird witness, as a silent witness to to the kind of activities that were happening there. Um, uh, yeah, and 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 you know, often he would, you know, it would it would seem like these were totally random coincidences, but in reality, they were highly calculated kind of. Um, appearances in these images. It was a kind of form of kind of anonymous promotion um, and the introduction of a kind of tangential narrative. All of a sudden you started wondering who is this guy who seems to be everywhere and walking in into all these different places. Um, yeah, so, but, and, and, and what's, what's amazing about this was that he also kind of, he, he also forced the newspaper to be a kind of unwilling collaborator. Um, and, and so he became this kind of silent bystander who was then um, forcing the, the newspaper to then kind of um, use him in these different ways. And the funny thing is, is um, even though the, the newspaper was not so happy about this, um, this eventually got so publicized that then it started um, entering into other newspapers for these actions. And so his influence just expanded further and further, proliferating out to infect others. Um, yeah. Um, you know, the, I mean, one, one thing that's significant about this is that he's always in the background, like I was mentioning before. And um, a, a great example of this um, is, is, is um, you know, that, that, you know, like in, in the cases with Johnny Modi, he was just kind of, he would just kind of sneak in and would have like kind of no identity in this case. But often, what, often um, the perception, the, the public's perception of the artist as a kind of innocuous, um, apolitical decorator gives us kind of space for a parasitical infiltration. So um, from 1995 to 1997, the artist Mel Chin brought together dozens of artists as the gala committee, and, and they staged a regular covert intervention into the primetime soap opera um, Melrose Place. So what they did was they they used their status as artists. They approached the set designer of the show and offered to supply free artworks as props in the background of all the scenes. So, so in this in this case, uh, th this project of covert in insertion was not intended to be subversive, but actually to kind of more offer a blueprint on how artists could collaborate and and um, uh, with commercial production from the inside, and also how how to use the kind of the mass popularity of 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 television media um, to to kind of give you more more recognition than uh, you would otherwise have within a gallery, um, and given that that TV regularly would promote certain products and lifestyles through embedded marketing, why couldn't it also serve as a, serve as a platform for art? So the way that they got in was by giving the art to them for free, but they used this opportunity to insert coded cultural messages on pressing topics like reproductive rights, reproductive rights, American forward policy, um, AIDS, alcoholism, um, sexual politics, like lots of lots of different kind of um, concerns of the day were being kind of implemented. And 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 it was just appearing just as as props or on, on side things. I mean, even this woman is 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 holding like a Chinese takeout. And that's also um, an artwork by one of the artists. And, you know, so so you have all this kind of thing. I mean, the culmination of the project was um, was an episode of Melrose Place where the actress Heather Locklear's character um, signs, uh, she's like an ad executive and she signs MOCA, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles as a client. And she attends the opening of Uncommon Sense, which was was an actual exhibition. Uh, or like no, it was a fake exhibition within a, a real show. So, um, and what's I mean the the paratextual implications of this is huge. I mean to be clear, 
Here is a, a fictional character's fake ad agency giving real publicity to a real museum that is exhibiting the real secret art that appeared in the fake show, the fake world of the real show. <laughs> so it's a beautiful parasitical gesture. And, it, and, and, and what's great is, you know, if you, if you talk to Mel Chen about this today, you know, he says, well, it's still, it's still happening. I mean, we're not no longer doing the works, but this is syndicated. It's still, it's still around. You got the, the reruns on, uh, on this. Um, you know, another kind of more obvious example is uh, someone like David Horvitz, who um, from, for many years has been trying to insert his own images into Wikipedia. Um, here's his project mood disorder where he, he put this image and because, um, you know, these things become, you know, because it's on Wikipedia, then it gets reproduced in all these other kind of formats. And I think that that's, that's an interesting kind of model. Um, oh, I don't, I, yeah. Um, you know, another, and, and yeah. And, and then becomes kind of stock imagery that, that, that goes around. Another thing that he was doing was that he was, um, uh, he would he would appear on beaches along the coast of California, which is um, apparently publicly accessible. So so for every beach in California, it would always be a picture of him standing there. Um, you know, at different times, people people caught on. I mean, I think I mean one one more recent uh, version of this or s similar kind of mentality that I, I should have brought into here is um, Oliver Lyric, um, uh, Austrian artist who, who um, he, he has for many years been going around uh, 3D scanning, doing uh, digital renderings of, of um, um, uh, 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 museum collections. So he convinces different museums that he works with to allow him to then take that and make it, uh, uh, take that uh, 3D rendering, the 3D scan of, of these objects and to make it uh, open source. And what he does is he provides it out for free. But then over time, he's accumulated this massive archive of people using those exact sculptures in all types of different things. He said that like one of the uh, one of like the top ones was when he was watching Eurovision like a few years ago, and they used one of his scans in the background, you know, so it's like, it's also about like, I mean, especially in that context, it's also about taking this kind of private public property of the museum collection and 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 rendering it into public, but then by allowing things be open source, it also allows it to be then kind of used and misused in all these different ways. So he builds a kind of archive through people's kind of meme like um, uh, interpretation of these things. Um, I'm not going to go into it too much, but I mean, I, I think I think most of you better than I would would know of 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 plenty of 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 um, great kind of parasitical gestures that have involved um, social media. Um, and one of the early kind of most iconic ones was the Argentinian artist Amalia Ullman, who curated an Instagram profile that documented the kind of life uh, of life of a kind of wannabe it girl um, going to trying to make it in LA and getting a, a, a boob job and, and, and doing a public apology and, 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 and all this kind of um, trying to create a kind of personal story within the kind of public space of the, the Instagram. And at one point she had like 90,000 followers and they were following it with like lots of intensity, but then she revealed that it was a hoax and it was just a, an exercise and kind of curiosity. Um, maybe, Maybe we should take like a like a five minute break if that's okay. Is does that does that make sense? Or should we just go on? Um, I know this is going on forever, um, but I but I promise we're actually going to get somewhere. Um, yeah, let's let's take a let's take a five minute break. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, please. <laughs>
Okay. Uh, should I just go ahead? I think uh, it's kind of hard because everybody's quite silent. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, now, now we're beginning to finally hit some of the artists that we'll be um, meeting in this project. Um, <clears throat> one artist who who regularly parasit uh, parasites media to work as collaborators is the German artist uh, Christian Jankowski, and he's going to be presenting on our fifth session. In an earlier work, he elicited sponsors for a project and then lost it all gambling. Um, in another work, he went to the site. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. In, a, in another work, he went to a psychotherapist to help him deal with his creative block, who diagnosed that the cause of, uh, of uh, his blockage was that he was transferring his mother son relationship to the female curator of the exhibition. Perhaps his most. Jeez. Perhaps his most famous work is, is um, uh, Telemystica. In, in 1999, um, uh, Jankowski was invited to exhibit in the, the Venice Biennial, and for his contribution, he learned Italian and called five Italian TV fortune tellers, like TV psychics, asking them to predict his future as an artist and to forecast the success of his biennial contribution. The question he posed to each reflects concerns common to many artists. Like first, is this a good idea? Uh, second, will I manage to make the work with little money and a lot of time? Third, once once the work is finished, will it look good and be presented well? For, fourth, will the, will the public like the work? And finally, will I be happy with my own work? And so all of these different psychics are, are kind of uh, uh, digging into their minds and, and, and um, into the ether and trying to give him uh, diagnoses and, and predictions about how great his contribution to the Venice Biennial would be. As it turned out, the work was a self-fulfilling prophecy since Telemystica contributed fundamentally to this artist's kind of breakthrough. Like people really became aware of his of practice at that point. Um, and in this case, he was often using his position as an artist to be able to enter into these kind of spaces. Um, in 2000, Three, he appeared on a Greek tele uh, talk show, and since he couldn't speak Greek, he just walked around and played with the guests, serving as this kind of silent witness as they were kind of commenting on him. Um, in 2009, uh, he convinced an auctioneer at the auction house Christie's to sell the clothes off his own back. Um, so he literally d w was undressing there and then selling off like all the way down to his, uh, to his little auctioneer gavel <laughs> um you know so again he's using the system against itself to make his work and uses his position as an artist um uh, to get to places where he normally couldn't um probably my favorite work of christians i i mean i i think um he hasn't really decided what he will present in this case i i imagine that one of the things that he'll present is um um his manifesto contribution he 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 curated manifesto a few years ago and um the big uh biennial art festival that's always moving around in europe and and what he did was was each of the artists had to had to do a kind of parasitical project where they collaborated with different industries and different people um of their choice and so um was very much a part of that but my favorite work i i'd say is um his work casting jesus and so what in this case he enlisted the Vatican to hold this kind of American Idol style casting competition for their favorite Jesus. So these were the like the final final decisions. And um, and after the Jesus was chosen, he then made numerous public appearances in Mexico, including like a cameo in a telenovela soap opera. Um, and this is this is kind of problematic. I mean, I, I was I was doing an exhibition um, at, at the same gallery um, in Mexico at the at the time that this was done. And, um, you know, they we had Jesus, who was a very s sweet guy <laughs> and kind of more of like a hippie Buddhist dude. But he um, but, you know, there was you know, the, the plan was to ha have him make all these kind of public appearances. So he appeared in Zocalo, the, the, the big uh, a religious square in the center of the city and people just i mean really you've, you you should have seen like the the way that these like old grandmas and other people were just going nuts over this uh, uh the return of jesus in this way and um so it 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 shows also like this kind of 
you know, Christian's work as as much as it um, as it enters into different systems and and kind of plays with their kind of the the roles. Or in this case, he was maybe making more fun of the Vatican than he was about um, Christians in this sense. Um, but at the same time, it it sometimes ends up with kind of un, un, uneven consequences where where you know, of course, it was also like kind of um, abusive somehow by by um, uh, bringing Jesus into these kind of places and giving people uh, false hope or um, you know this kind of demystification or anything. So it it was pretty heavy. Um, you know, I mean, like a, a much earlier kind of antecedent would be um, in 1991. Um, on this like really important uh, television show in, in the USSR at the very end of the USSR called The Fifth Wheel. Um, the artist and, and musician and, and activist Sergei Kuryakin appeared and he, for, for an hour, he spoke in a serious scholarly tour, uh, tone and displayed historical photographs, documentary footage, film clips, and interviews with scientists. And he put forward this remarkable thesis that was essentially that much uh, that Vladimir Lenin was a mushroom and the entire uh, the way that he does it he builds this kind of very um scholarly kind of uh logic here he he like he's quoting for published uh, memoirs he's he's borrowing from scholarly books and other literary sources he's got a library behind him and he's just sitting there kind of talking about things he'll he'll in in the show it would it would show like th these different kind of important kind of documentary photographs all these kind of photographs that everybody at the ussr at that point had learned enough about lenin um <laughs> that they uh they, they would instantly recognize this as maybe one of the most iconic kind of photographs but you could see um uh down in the right uh in near Lenin's left hand, there's this little, there's this little thing. And he was saying that that was actually a mushroom and that, that, that must've been it. And that, um, that the Bolshev uh, that the Bolshevik Re revolution of course happened in October in Ukraine. And during that time, lots of people were eating mushrooms, maybe they were eating psychedelic mushrooms and that those eventually starts kind of supplanting people's personality. So then it must be that they, that Lenin is a mushroom and he became a mushroom. Um, I, I wasn't able to show this, uh, sh show clips from this because it's a uh, copy written material, but I'll, I'll, I'll put it on the, the, um, on the Google classroom or whatever. Um, so you guys can watch this movie. Cause, uh, th like there's, there's some sections that are, that are in English that are really, really quite nice. Um, but what, and, and, and what, what kind of happened was that, um, you know, despite him saying this kind of claim, lots of people really believed it. And I mean, most people were actually more shocked that somebody would say something so taboo about uh, uh, about Lenin, uh, about, you know, the father of 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 the Russian Revolution. And um, and and, you know, how 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 could you, that you couldn't dismiss it as a joke because it's Lenin and it must be there. And, and a lot of analysts sent, since then have have identified um, this kind of moment on on television as one of the kind of markers for when 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 all of a sudden Lenin's kind of surplus had kind of exceeded itself and and now people could just kind of say anything and that the Soviet system was totally collapsing because it was no no longer was working but the way that uh, yeah yeah like in this he even like points to some kid in these different images and he says it's the same kid but it's not i mean uh he says it's a girl but uh, you can't really tell you you never know who he's talking about he he does interviews with real mycologists and real like biologists to talk about mushrooms so like it's it just he creates a kind of substantiated argument and it's very much uh, i mean my my favorite part is when he he shows a diagram of like uh Lenin's military car and then he shows oh see it's just like a mushroom it has the same shape as a as a mycelial um hyphae <laughs> and stuff and, and like it's it's really quite funny but I mean the way that he did this is is kind of what what makes it a parasitical gesture to make his outrageous uh claim seem plausible he had to present evidence and so he had all these kind of markers of evidence you know the photograph the book the the expert the scientist the literate the literate person the the you know books behind him i mean he seems like he's uh 
you know, it, 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 it seems like it's a very well, well thought out, very kind of thoughtful kind of, um, uh, insightful kind of, um, uh, academic scholarly, um, uh, work here. And so, and, and, and because of the medium of television also, he could say things and, and very quickly change to, to some other uh, topic and you would never, uh, and you, you weren't able to like verify if, if, if it really was a mushroom in that picture or, or anything because of the kind of the, the pacing and the way that the television program was working. So in this case, he was very much kind of borrowing and, 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 and manipulating the kind of system, but also manipulating all these kind of markers of authority and authenticity, all these kind of like, you know, all these signs that make us believe that somebody must be saying something uh, important or real or, or, or true or significant um, because of all of this other context, all of these other kind of um, uh, corroborating evidence. Um, and in an interview, I mean, I, I'll just read this interview just to show that he was also very much aware of, of this. But he says, what I do is something different, it is a form of parasit uh, parasitizing on an existing archetype. This is precisely what I do, parasitizing. I am a parasite and also a bastard, a cretin and a piece of shit. I would like to introduce the word parasite as a new term. A parasite is ambivalent. Being a parasite vis-a-vis -a, -vis a system means on the one hand, possessing a structure that is completely independent of the system, but on the other hand, being part of the system, feeding off of it. Parasitizing is like looking deep into things, not negating, ridiculing, or judging them, but making visible their internal criteria. So this is like, that's kind of a thesis statement. And, and um, you know, it, it hadn't been translated yet, but it's it's totally it, it's as if um, him and, and Michel Serra were speaking in the same voice in that case. Um, you know, so Currican's uh, uh, aesthetic approach was to always occupy and cultivate the position of a parasite who, having infiltrated the system, introduced noise into its kind of authoritative channels of communication. Um, he infiltrated the system's internal structure and faithfully reproduced the forms of its political rhetoric, its language, mass media, system of presenting evidence, and its focus on recovering original and previously unknown meanings hidden behind canonical documents, images, and texts. Um, an uh, another great example of using the media as, as a, to, to parasite and to, to give kind of, to add noise into the kind of signal was the American artist group, uh, the Yes Men. Um, they often par uh, parasite specific forms of address and assume the semblances of other entities, which grants them access to sites or contexts that are otherwise inaccessible, especially for activists. Um, so they're never really, they're never, I mean, I guess now they are officially uh, asked to speak, but, um, you know, I mean, their entire kind of project started when they did a kind of, um, uh, a kind of, um, a spoof website of the World Trade Organization uh, amidst um, the World Trade Organization and, and, and in 1996 was having a number of, of, of different meetings. And so what they what they did was they they made a kind of website that looked just like the World Trade Organization and everything. And then media people started inviting them. And at first they just thought that it was a joke and they had just uh, put in these kind of press releases that they were announcing that the World Trade Organization was disbanding or that the World Trade Organization would, would change and become um, a more kind of equitable regulatory agency to, to be able to, to help the world and all these other things. But because of this, they just kept getting invited to kind of speak, uh, speak on behalf of the World Trade Organization. And what was, um, you know, l later on, they would do a, a similar thing in 2004, um, where um, the Yes Men member Andy Bicklebaum posed as a spokesperson for Dow Chemical named Jude Finisterra on, on BBC World TV. So even like, you know, the BBC could look on a website and accidentally invite this kind of um, uh, this, this, this parody of, of, of them. And so this, this was a conversation that was um, meant to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the 1984 Union Carbide Bhopal disaster, um, where a, a massive amount of chemical, lethal chemicals was spilled in Bhopal, India, and people are still dying and, and, and affected by this. And um, Dow Chemical had bought um, Union Carbide and had become the, 
that thus responsible for it, but they had never taken responsibility for the disaster. So for their intervention, um, he appeared on BBC and he said, guys, we're, after 20 years, we're finally going, um, uh, Union Carbide is finally going to take uh, responsibility for the Bhopal disaster. And we're sorry, and we're going to create a, a, a fund to be able to pay everybody and everything. And people believed it. I mean, it was like headline news that, that somebody uh, would, would do this. And, um, you know, what, what, I mean, he, he, I mean, even within his speech, he said, it's the first time in history that a publicly owned company of anything near the size of Dow has performed an action that is significantly against its bottom line simply because it is the right thing to do. So, like, apparently um, the, the, the company's stock lost value. Um, uh, victims and other people were going kind of crazy, but for like those two, um, what what ended up happening was that then Dow Chemical had to come out and say we are not taking responsibility for the Bhopal disaster. So by kind of inhabiting the voice of 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 this kind of institution, he's able to kind of um, uh, he he he's able to kind of ventriloquize their words. But it then forces the system to then have to come back and say, no, we're not taking responsibility for this horrible thing that we've done. So it's, um, it's you know, just as Modi, he uses the, the yes men use the kind of spectacle of the media apparatus as, as um, you know, as, and, as, as a way to be able to kind of introduce um, counter information, to, to introduce noise into the kind of signal. Um, you know, and, and their uncanny ability to transform, which is as simple as, you know, a, a shitty ripoff website and a business suit, it allows them to be able to access all these kind of different places of power. Um, and it's a type of ventriloquism that forces the host to enunciate against its will, or even without its knowledge. Um, you know, one, one, one could think of a number of different kind of other uh, interventions by artists where they've used kind of uh, markers of authority and authenticity. Um, you know, this is, this is what um, uh, John Searle, um, this linguist and social philosopher, refers to um, in his text, uh, What is an Institution? He talks about langu how language forms this kind of um, institution and that it's, that, um, you know, it's, it, um, you know, that, that um, there's all these kind of forms that that the, these different systems use as status indicators that 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 allow you to believe that that must mean that they, that that this institution is legitimate, powerful, and 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 you would make decisions that you otherwise wouldn't make. So these like status indicators of like passports, driver's licenses, marriage certificates, wedding rings, you know, uniforms, all these different kind of things that 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 m means. That that are the indication of somebody a representative of an institution. So it's um it's very much kind of playing with this. Um, you know, in uh, 1991 at um, the NSK, this Slovenian artist group that is also connected to to the kind of uh, also parodic par parasitical musical apparatus uh, Leibach, um They they did a thing where they they um, claimed to be a kind of sovereign state of sorts. Um, and and um, similar to like micronations, and they started issuing passports, um, um, which they defined as a stateless state. And what ended up happening was um, because of the fact that that they that people assumed that because it's it was this group, Noi Slovenish Kunst, Kunst meaning New Slovenian Art, that that must mean that they would uh, that this passport would also grant people access to Europe um, generally. So um, at, at one point, there was a huge amount of, of applications to try to get uh, the NS, uh, NSK state um, passport because, it, um, because they wanted to uh, be able to have access to Europe. Um, and in this case, you could, you could see this as also being um, quite manipulative. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't their intention at all, but, but um, you know, it gave people a lot of kind of false hope in this case. Um, you know, it ends up as actually quite a, a, a bad thing because many of these passports were traded on the black market and people paid like horrendous sums to shady middlemen who promised that this passport would allow them to, to come to Europe. And it, of course, did not because it was just a kind of uh, a, an object, you know. 
I mean, to parasite uh, a channel of authoritative communication is not only to make visible the falseness of an institution's voice, but also to show that these contrived pathways have real world effects. So like whether or not somebody has papers or not allows them different access and, and different power. As arbitrary as the institution's voice may seem, the symbolic pronouncements that are articulated in these bureaucratic documents regulate the movements, behavior, and self-identification of, of, of people. And the power granted in law to certain actors makes their decisions kind of inviolable. And therefore, the approval of the state is necessary for a subject's kind of self-constitution. Um, you know, and, and um, you know, I mean, think about people without papers, without passports. All of a sudden, they're, they're exclusion, not just from the system or from, from uh, certain nation states, but they're also therefore kind of invisible and silent. And they're kind of um, uh, therefore illegal in, in, in this uh, context. Um, you know, it's a similar kind of uh, project was was by the uh, Spanish artist uh, Nuria Guil, who she she often flirts with kind of power and 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 works with these kind of collaborators to kind of implement different things. And she's very much about kind of redirecting the privileges that she might have um, as a person or the kind of privileges that are provided from artistic institutions. And she tries to kind of redirect them into other places. Um, so one one example uh, is that is is her piece um, humanitarian aid, where she um, married a a uh, she had like an open call for love letters for reasons why you should be why you should get married um, to um, uh, Cubans who wanted to 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 come to Spain to marry her and so what she did was she mar married this man and um, uh, and lived with him for for five years or something and brought him to Spain. Um, in in some writing and other reports, it was actually quite abusive because I mean, well, one could think of lots of instances of kind of sh sham marriages and other things, but it's like in many ways he wasn't getting anything out of uh, return. I, I think her initial thought was that that he, she was providing some sort of um, form of charity or solidarity by by sharing her privilege as a Spanish citizen. Um, but in many ways, it was a kind of form of imprisonment. There was there was an interview with him uh, afterwards where where he said like you know I went to Spain and then what could I do? I all the, I I had no friends. I had no uh, access. I didn't really want to be there, but I had to stay to be able to maintain um, this status. And it, it becomes this kind of um kind of a dirty contract in that sense. And I, I have a feeling that Nuria Grell also like um, uh, learned something from this because a, a few years later she did a project called uh, Stateless by Choice, and so in this case she she went to the um, Spanish state and tried to um, uh, she tried to cancel her Spanish citizenship, which apparently is very difficult to do. Um, you can. You could trade your citizenship, you know, those of you with multiple nationalities, you could, uh, some of them allow you to have two passports, others only allow you to have one, but, but um, you can't really become, you can't, uh, a person can't choose to be stateless. And I think that this was very much part of her kind of thing. I think she was trying to kind of deal with um, nationality as this thing that is kind of, um, that is just conferred to a person without any uh, kind of thing. It's an unearned privilege that is that is uh, given, and she wanted to kind of take control over that that um, privilege. And of course, she was denied. She was uh, she she uh, was never able to to not be Spanish, which is why I still refer to her as a Spanish citizen. Um, you know, in these flows of uh, detached bureaucratic exchange, there are often these kind of hiccups or mistakes that def kind of defer the normal passage of information through appropriate channels to open up space. Uh, and, and these kind of open up spaces for artists to enter. Um, you know, so the, the kind of proclaimed impartiality of the state um, can, can kind of, uh, the artist can kind of force them to unknowingly accept false claims. Um, a good example is like the Vietnamese Danish artist Don Vo had a had a curious project where um, he through bureaucratic documents he was constructing the life story of a fictional son who um, uh, only through um, applying for the uh, appropriate papers and eventually he applied for the birth uh, for the death certificate and 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 ki killed his non-existing son. Um, another another work that he he did was that he was 
continuously uh, marrying and divorcing people um, in order to kind of add their family names to his own. Um, and, 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 you know, part of that was also a kind of joke on the way that um, uh, as, as a Vietnamese refugee uh, who grew up in Denmark, that his name was always kind of in constant kind of dispute in, in this case. And so he, he was like, okay, well then I'll just, I'll just get some Danish names and I'll just like take my friends and then we could just be married and then we'll just divorce as soon as I can keep the name and, and just move on from there. So, um, you know, Anna Tessera Pinto observed um, about Vo's work at that time that in the stage class between bureaucracy and biography, the dismaying outcome is not that bureaucracy might impair biography, but that biography is an effect of, democ uh, of bureaucracy. You know, that, that our biographies are constructed through all these kind of these status indicators, all these pieces of paper that are identifying us in all these different ways. And so he was very much playing with that. Um, Another notable example in the last few years related to, to passports was Oscar Murillo um, on his way to participate in the Sydney Biennial. Um, he ripped up his British passport and flushed it down the toilet um, as, a, as a protest um, to the colonial situation, which we're still in. Um, you know, basically, he was responding to the fact that that um, he didn't like the way that his work was being framed and how his status as a British citizen was actually like funding his travel and participation in the show. And and throughout this whole thing, like they were like, for, for this in intensive purposes, we're gonna call you British. But he was like, well, I'm Colombian. I immigrated to the UK and I, I now have a British passport, but but he wanted to maintain this. And, um, you know, I mean, he wanted to create a situation that directly commented on his geopolitical identity by flushing his passports uh, uh, in, uh, out the, um, into the toilet. And um, what was really funny was that he, what, what he ended up doing was also creating this kind of traumatizing situation for the state as well, because like if somebody arrives and all of a sudden they don't have a passport, it creates all of this other kind of uh, issues. And um, for him, it was very much a, uh, it, that in, in, in one interview, he says it was a way to reboot himself, to start off from scratch, just like he did when he arrived from Columbia to London. So it was, it was um, you know, it, it created this kind of um, uh, conflict. And also it, it ended up having him uh, deported because he had come under false pretenses or whatever. And but then he was able to 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 reclaim his kind of Colombianness and and discard the Britishness. Um, often, I mean, one one kind of parasitical maneuver that we're that we're all experiencing as as artists is the way the nationality is attached to people and how that often is is um, uh, gets funneled into these different funding structures and different um, different kind of um, uh, partnerships and all these other things that um, uh, again become highly problematic and also um, reduces our identity to these different things. But I really love um, the, the fact that he mentioned uh, rebooting because it reminds me of this, this project um, by uh, Kristen Lucas, who officially changed her name from Kristen Lucas to Kristen Lucas. Um, in, in 2007, she officially changed her name um, at the Superior uh, Court of California in Oakland. And what she did was she traded her name for the exact same name. And she said that, that it, she called the project Refresh because she wanted to refresh her identity as though she, it was a web page. Um, so when you look at a web page, you're seeing the data that is assigned to it by a server. But if you hit refresh, nothing has, has changed. But um, uh, what, what appears on the screen is the same. But in fact, a whole new set of data has, has then now been retrieved by the server. Um, she felt that she wanted to be the same person, but in a new place in her life. And so, so through this, she, she actually, she had to, to do all these kind of things of like uh, public notice saying that she's changing her name. Um, you know, she had to go through all these court documents and eventually she, she had a kind of, um, she had a hearing with a judge and the judge became this kind of, um, you know, they, they were kind of forced into this kind of uh, philosophical and methodological paradox. Uh, there's, a, there's a great transcript of it where the judge is like, you know, if I deny you, then nothing, then it's, it's the same effect. But if I accept this, then I'm letting you play with the court. And, um, 
you know, so so here she's kind of forcing the host to kind of reorient and and reappraise their own kind of role in this, and forces the judge to be a kind of half complicit collaborator, um, and whose whose participation actually makes the project um, uh, valuable. Um, you know, a similar strategy is when uh, three artists in Slovenia decided to change their name to uh, Janis Janza, who now is a, uh, actually the the president, yeah, president or prime minister of of Slovenia. I don't want to get that mixed up, but um, but yeah, I mean, a super conservative, total asshole. I mean, they did this in two thousand seven. He he's only become more of an asshole since then. And these artists have all changed their names in official documents and professionally to Janis Janza. So they uh, still function as Janis Janza, and now there's four of the uh, Janis Janzas walking around. So here they they also like take they don't just take the authority of 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 um, of this politician, but they also take his name and take his identity and create more confusion surrounding him. Um, you know, I mean, while some people have have said that it it's kind of one of these things that only kind of existed in the media, it is. It, it creates this kind of regular kind of confusion that whenever the, the, the name Janis Janza comes out, you're never sure if you're, they're talking about the artist or they're talking about the, the, the Slovenian prime minister. Um, you know, another great example of, 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 of doing this to, of, of doing kind of parasitical actions to attack popular po politicians was when uh, Jonas Stahl started making, I think he made like 20 or 30 of these, where he made these roadside memorials for the still living ultra conservative and racist politician Gert Wilders. So he was doing these kind of like memorials to the death of Wilders, even though he wasn't dead. And actually it ended up in court even, like they, uh, he tried to say that that was um, some sort of threat. And then, you know, Stahl's like, what are you talking about? It's an artwork. And, and what artists are supposed to do is envision a utopian future. And what I envision is you not being here. <laughs> it's very simple in this sense. Um, you know, I mean, Jonas Stahl has long been fascinated by the spaces where art converges with politics, and um, his practice is kind of emblematic of another kind of um, parasitical strategy where artists use the resources and cover of art to implement larger political projects. So a good example of that is, is his uh, New, New World Summit, which is um, it's an attempt to kind of create an artistic and political organization that, that, that develops parliaments for stateless states or autonomous groups or blacklisted political organizations because like lots of like um if if your state for instance uh kurdistan um or palestine and lots of other countries are not recognized um then all of a sudden you're not allowed to be at the table of of kind of international politics you're not uh you, you're not even allowed to travel in certain ways because you might be registered as a terrorist organization and then all of a sudden you're excluded not only from financial resources but also um from from being able to to find uh support in others and so what what Jonas Stahl has been doing for, for for many years now has been kind of staging these kind of uh, parliamentary sessions where kind of um, different groups that have been kind of marginalized at the edge of, of kind of political uh, of, of, of global politics um, can now come and talk and be able to develop their own kind of models and possibilities of resistance. Um, and the only way that this thing has been able to happen has been about um, expropriating art art money to be able to do this. The only way that they've been able to get um, the visas that are uh, necessary to have such people, I mean, this was originally done in Berlin, but now it's also been in uh, Rojava and in, um, in Rojava, sorry, Rojava and in, in, uh, Kurdistan and some other places where, where um, you know, the, the fact that it's art allows them to be able to to create these uh, to bring these political organizations in and also is allowed to pro uh, provide all these type of mat uh, uh, materials. Um, so in this uh, in this case, I mean, I mean, I, I think all of us could think of many others who have redirected the resources that they have access to as artists to implement like social or political projects or provide a service or a space for community by hijacking the institution or redirecting its workings or its uh, financial re resources or its, its space. 
I mean, um, you know, this this happens on a micro scale. I mean, um, Tanya Baguera and, and Thester Gates are both well known for the fact that they use the money that they that they get as artists and as teachers to then be able to fund um, like uh, Thester Gates has established like um, half a dozen community centers in, in Chicago and um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, Tanya Bergera will use it to, to fund for schools or for political action groups. Um, another recent example was uh, the Indonesian artist Walk the Rock uh, doing the Parasite Lottery, which is this kind of collective lottery system. Um, it's kind of a micro lending thing. Essentially, you get a bunch of institutions together and then everybody, uh, everybody kind of like go, goes in this kind of bidding lottery kind of contest and the money that that everybody kind of pools together then gets given to these different um, the uh, to the winning group who then uses that money. And um, he has a kind of rule that that if the winners who receive the money um, they have to use it as a fee for deviation, which means that they um, they have to use the prize money not on something that they would otherwise have never bought. Um, this is a nice idea, I think. Um, although I think it it brings up a lot of big questions about complicity that I think will become um, a question. And 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 also it's a uh, it's uh, I, mean, I think he's trying to use um, logics of kind of micro loans and micro lending that that is um, uh, very popular in in Indonesia and other places. But um, yeah, I, I I wonder how how it works beyond like a, a simple gesture within the context of of the Netherlands or, or elsewhere. Um, I, for one, am, am more interested in how the parasitical strategy can can not just simply function as a form of charity like this, but can actually contest the systems in which they are working and offer something new or reveal the logic of property and power that's 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 within these institutions. Um, you know, I I won't spend much time. I I I'll just mention it really uh, uh, quick, but like. You know, um, one one artist who I will um, refer to in in the in the final talk is uh, Cameron Rowland, who I think is a really good example of somebody who is using um, the kind of mechanisms of 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 property and exchange and and uh, and support and charity from from these different institutions to be able to actually interrogate the 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 real kind of base conditions in which these uh, institutions operate. So I mean, one example is like uh, in the 2017 Whitney Biennial, Roland persuaded the museum to invest 25,000 US dollars um, for um, to to give money to the Ventura County Project, which is an organization that that um, is meant to combat recidivism. But the 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 project's also about like showing, it's about funneling public money into private enterprise. And in this case, it's it's also showing how museums and often also within the, the carsicle system that often public money is then given to private enterprise and turned into this kind of commodification of incar uh, incarcerated people. Um, and so he was he was both kind of calling out the Whitney for their own kind of benef uh, uh, be benefiting from these kind of ideas of administering public welfare, but also talking about their kind of dirty relations between um, public and private um, um, uh, enterprises. Um, you know, another uh, great example from his work is is um, is is at the ICA in, in in London. He he identified that the that the mahogany in the doors of this uh, um, and uh, of 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 the building and and also on like a banister and stuff were were um, you know of course were uh, came through global networks of trade and were actually uh, cut down and worked on by slave labor in Barbados and the Caribbean and that these things came there and that they had been uh, moved around. And so then he used the kind of logic of, of, of mortgaging. He, he's created a lot of these kind of um, these different kind of uh, financial and insurance kind of instruments that will then. Um, so what, what he's done is he's mortgaged that the 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 wood, the, the, the mahogany of these doors as a way of being able to kind of call out um, the ICA's complicity in the history of, of, of racialized colonialism and, 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 how, and, and it's kind of part of a kind of global uh, trade thing. 
but he also calls out the the institution itself so cuz he use, he diverts the the institution's money to then mortgage and use that money to be uh to sell the uh, to to use the mahogany so he's very much like calling out this kind of um this critique of prop uh, he's he's engaging in a in an active critique of property and um and and in and 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 using using also the kind of um the the kind of loan mechan like mechanisms of loans insurance mortgaging all these different kind of financial instruments that are used around this stuff and he he switches the kind of um modes of of power in relationship to this and and by by doing this he the the hope is that this the extra fund the the money that would normally be this surplus from all these kind of other financial instruments would then be then um would be then channeled back into um something much more um beneficial so um i'll, I'll talk about him a, a little bit more because i mean he, he has really complex kind of works but i think he's quite significant as as an artist who is um entering into, into institutions and 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 use it using the kind of mechanisms of that and, and using the kind of economic mechanisms that are surrounding us as ways of being able to contest kind of uh, logics of, of property and power as it's um, been um, historically and today within kind of racialized capitalism. So um, he's quite, quite interesting. Um, you know, the parasites kind of re-envisioning of alternative economic and support models can also be found in uh, Mayor Vita Corp. Which is um, the Better Life Corporation, and it's it's a pseudo corporation that Minerva Cuevas, um, who will be speaking, I think, on our third session, yeah, and um, and she she established this in 1998, and it's the essentially it's a corporation that questions the capitalist economic system by creating, promoting, and distributing products and services for free, so. So what they do is they they implement. I mean, I say they, but it's it's mostly just Minerva, which is also uh, something that I think we will talk about when she when she comes and talk. But um, what they uh, what what it does is it implements systemic acts of uh, generosity, providing objects that respond to urgent needs in society, from giving away subway tickets at rush hour to issuing like she was issuing the um, uh, student ID cards so that people could use that to be able to get um, discounts in other places. Um, she she would also um, uh, she was also distributing barcodes that would allow you to to get like fake barcodes that you could throw onto food and make it cheaper. Um, uh, one of one of the earliest ones was was that there was this campaign that was going around in Mexico City that said awake is aware that um, trying to warn people not to fall asleep. And so what she was doing was um, she was parasitically using these kind of um, this kind of state uh, marketing campaign and she was uh, putting caffeine pills. Um, available for people in case that they're worried about that. So she's also kind of parasitizing, kind of adding on to these already existing kind of state, this kind of weird mix of, of um, state and commercial advertising and, um, and using those type of uh, forms of mass public address as, as, as a means of being able to proliferate um, free stuff and to kind of give, a, I mean, she calls it a kind of form of utopian rebellion um you know and oft, often um you know th these campaigns and interventions certainly contact i mean they i mean they're, they're they're not so different from her more gallery oriented work that test kind of economic and human ties by making kind of visible these historical colonial economic and ecological exchanges within our economy but um you know she really sees mayor vita as as autonomous and, and kind of only existing in social conditions functioning as this kind of part of her kind of bigger political engagement so so i mean i mean it's it's funny because you could think of it as a potlatch like an like an artist is is um, giving this stuff away and and then receiving um, the prestige, or she can call it an artwork, and then she's like she's benefiting from it in this way. But but I think I think for her it's very much more aligned with uh, anarchist, autonomous, and communitarian principles. It's it's kind of an earnest attempt to create kind of um, 
a kind of disturbance and a, and a, and a space of possibility, um, which is limited to the to the means and and uh, and abilities of 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 the main uh, CEO of, of of this place, this this one artist, Minerva Cuevas. So I think I think our conversation and her presentation will be really really fascinating in relationship to to working within gallery spaces and outside of gallery spaces and and how and and what is the difference in terms of these kind of strategies because I would say both parts of her practice are oriented around kind of parasitical like using certain kind of networks and material kind of circulations to be able to uh, develop the work but there there is certainly a diff uh, or it sounds as if she sees a a fundamental difference between her activities in Mayo Vida versus um, her own stuff. So, so, so that's something interesting. I mean, I mean, just to, I mean, I, I think in 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 um, Central and South America, you you have a lot of kind of these kind of actions, and a lot of that's coming from the necessity and and the inextricable relationship between kind of conceptual practices and radical autonomous practices. Um, you know, and a good example of this is um, the recently deceased Guatemalan artist, uh, Anibal Lopez, who was named, uh, who he, he changed his name to his ID number, which is A153167, but people still just called him Anibal Lopez. But he did this piece in 2000 that was called El Prestimo, um, The Loan. So in, in this project, um, you, you may have read about it in my um, and in, in, in my text, but um, he he in Guatemala City, he he robbed uh, unsuspecting passerby at gunpoint and used the money that he got from that person to fund his ex exhibition. So thus, the victim becomes this kind of unwillingly becomes unwillingly turned into a patron. The the funding the funding everything around it, but then also everybody who comes um, to the exhibition become also implicated as accomplices in the crime. I think that this this piece is really important because it it also kind of identifies um, how how you know the the parasite is not just about using kind of ex existent kind of social relations but also inverting them. So in, in instead of having the artist being at the at um, you know be being dependent on on wealthy patrons or the state to be able to support himself, he makes, uh, he reverses that type of power dynamic. And, um, you know, I mean, what, th there's a funny interview with him, at, um, like um, a few years ago, um, before he passed away, where he, um, where he talks about how he was really surprised that, that, you know, no negative consequences came out of this. And he was like, well, I guess artists can do anything. I mean, <laughs> and, it, and it's funny because he had done quite a bit of kind of projects. I mean, uh, what, uh, that were, were quite um, hev heavily loaded kind of projects. Um, like at one point he, he, he dumped a bunch of uh, books on the, uh, on the, on, on the, at a busy intersection in Guatemala city as um, exactly one ton. Um, and another time he, he dumped coal before a military parade, uh, alluding to the burned material that was found in all these mass graves in, by the corrupt uh, Guatemalan government. And he also had a, a show with a live pig that people could play with at the opening. But then for the finissage, he served the pig, you know, Hugo. It's quite, quite simple, but all, always kind of, it's, it's an interesting kind of project. Um, you know, but... But but what's interesting about El, El Prestimo is that each subject position in the act is taking without giving. They're complicit in the field of relations. In taking money from the victim who the artist rendered a patron, Lopez demonstrates the degree which is Seri's assertion that exchange is always dangerous um, and gift is always a forfeit. Since we are not party to exchange, we are left to assume that the victim is either a wealthy beneficiary of capitalist exploitation, a victim of such a system, or more realistically, one is abused by both inequitable economic relations and an active agent within those structures. So in this case, I mean, this is, this is why he called it the loan, not the theft or the payment, because though the money has been taken from the patron, it will be returned in kind of symbolic capital or this kind of social capital of, of, um, of art existing in the world. And in this conceptualization, like all of these exchanges are predicated on a kind of abusive form of violence. Um, you know, so I think, I think that that becomes a, a really kind of big question. Um, I think, 
other other co questions of, uh, around this also comes uh, I I think one of the big questions that we'll be asking is also like how how parasitical of a gesture is something if it is like invited into an institution and how can artists um, use that logic to be able to to work with institutions and be able to extract value and and at what point does the institution kind of invalidate the kind of power uh, of their I mean, an example would be the artist collective Claire Fontaine, who, who uh, um, it's a it's a duo who are activists, writers, and scholars who whose artistic output is is a kind of uh, appropriate. It's a ready-made artist that's appropriated from a brand of French stationery, um, and so you know, I mean, they they use a lot of these type of ideas of uh, appropriation and expropriation, um, and in one of uh, in a in a series of works that uh, they've done, they'll they'll kind of um, They'll present lock picks, or they'll copy the um, they'll copy the keys of different galleries and museums and institutions. Therefore, like a lot, giving the kind of possibility that somebody could could steal or break into the place. Um, part of for them, it's kind of it's it's really it's for them maybe the bigger kind of thing is not just that they are. Um, that they're like hacking the institution and giving kind of secret access, but also that within the context of an art space, nobody ever takes these keys. Like um, when I was working at the Kunstverein in Munich, we had one of these keys and I, I had them on display all the time. Nobody ever touched them. And it's like, <laughs> and I, I think it's quite interesting. Um, you know, their power, Jester was powerful because they used their access to grant entry for others. But also were daring the audience to commit a crime, um, knowing that the crowd paying attention to the art context wouldn't do it because all of those habits of behavior within such spaces then teaches people that they're not allowed to take the keys that are sitting there that would allow them all this access. But what does it mean for an institution to invite an artist to make fun of them or critique them, to put themselves at risk? What does it mean for the artist? What, is, what does it mean for the gallerist, curator, collector, or other collaborator? Let's remember that 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 rich people love to laugh at themselves, and the king invites the joker into the roast and allows them to be the only person who can make fun of them. So you think of like Maurizio Catalan duct taping his galleries to the wall, or more recently Mathieu Malouf made a three D painting of his gallery three uh, D print of his galleries Lars Friedrich and sold them as additions. Um, you know, we we'll speak a lot about how many institutions nowadays do these projects that seek to actively critique their own institution, or at least try to give the illusion of of their interest in some sort of uh, socio political or educational change. But um, often in these institutions, they rarely make any changes to the conditions um, that that are actually underpinning all of these things. It might be just a project, and they might do things like like the Chisholm and Maria Icorn. You know, they might close the door and take a break for a few weeks, but that that makes that leaves the institution completely unchanged. And um, you know, I, I mean, another another question would be like, what what happens if the uh, if and when the artist goes too far and makes the institution really see itself in the mirror? An example of this would be um, this uh, Mexican architecture collective called Tesseron Quito. They did a residency at this place called New Langton Arts, which used to be called 80 Langton. It was it was it's it's the third old it was the third oldest um, artist run center in North America in San Francisco. Um, and in 2008, they invited to Serenquita to come in, and they wanted them to like question the boundaries between private and public space, and and exa examine their institution. You know, they thought that it would be just kind of a thing, and they were expecting something like this work, where where um, you know, where they cre uh, where to Serenquita created grassy patches in parking areas so that they could. Um, to to change the order of cars, or in in this project at the power plant in Toronto, they created an, they installed another door so that people didn't have to go through the front door to be able to come in, um, and 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 then they could like sneak in without going to the ticket counter. But at 80 Langton, um, what happened was Tessera Quito got there and they realized that this place was like suffering financially and and suffering organizationally. 
but they had this rich history. They had been an artist run center since 1970 and had this massive archive, um, not a collection, but just like, you know, random pieces of paper and weird data and, and all types of stuff. Um, I actually was working there. Um, I, it was my job to, to organize these boxes. Um, and and what was what was amazing was that Terakito did this um, project called New LinkedIn Arts Archive for Sale, a sacrificial act. So their premise was because this institution was suffering for so much um, and was was in all these kind of bad financial troubles, why not take the only thing that they had of value, which is their history, their memory, and put it up for auction and and sell it to be so sell sell your past to be able to to, to maintain your present and and future. Um, it was a view, beautiful provocative act. Um, so they literally boxed up the entire archive and put them out and it, it was up for sale. Um, and it was it was weird because, um, you know, it, it, it was it was it was weird because it, it, it created this kind of question about like what is the memory of an institution and, and some other um, people were rightfully saying like well we should just clone it and then then we you could do whatever you want with those pieces of paper and, and stuff and I, I, I would really agree but at the same time this was right at the time when this institution was at its kind of breaking point and um, within um, within less than a year later, the director of the institution um, sent out an email and it said we're we're out of money we're getting kicked out of our uh, 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 we're, we're getting evicted from our place. I quit I'm leaving town and she sent the email and got on an airplane and that was it and so like now this institution is is totally gone and luckily I mean this archive was maintained by by someone but it was this kind of you know, essentially, um, to Serakito's kind of provocation of this institution, then kind of forced the institution to then um, reevaluate itself and um, subsequently die, you know. Um, you know, there's there's always this kind of mentality that if you put an artist in a room, then things are going to just get better. Um, and I think that that's, that 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 could be a fatal mistake. Um, you know, I, you know, some some positive kind of um, attempts at this was like the artist placement group, who in the in the seventies in the UK, um, uh, uh, it was it was uh, Barbara, St uh, yeah, Barbara Stevani and uh, John Latham. Oh, sorry, nineteen sixty six, and it was it was around until the nineteen ninety one. Their whole kind of premise was to to place artists in residencies in different industries and different uh, offices and everywhere. I mean, it's. Um, if you talk to friends from from uh, post Soviet states, like that was also a common thing a long uh, time ago, where you would have like um, you you would you would have an artist residency in the public hospital or an artist residency because they needed to keep the artist employed, and so their premise was like why like like you know the ideas in industry are going to get more interesting if you put an artist there and the artist is going to get something out of this if they if they develop work and learn from the ways that you're working um you know other examples are like the experiments in art and technology in, in new york the in the 60s they also were trying to um they were trying to fuse art science and industry by um, getting engineers to collaborate with artists um another example is uh I can't go too far into this because I, I wrote my master's thesis on them, but it was um, th this Canadian conceptual art group called the Anything Company. They were a kind of um, suburban family pseudo corporation conceptual artist group that were um, that kind of jumped into kind of corporate uh, 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 mentalities. I mean, not only were they using like telex, like early fax machines and and trying to kind of like automate it and they, they really had this kind of McLuhan esque kind of thing, but they also um, were promoting their artwork within um, economic trade fairs or they were sponsoring uh, hockey teams or they were um, uh, they at one point they started up um, uh, uh, like a restaurant called uh, I Scream, which is a great name. And, you know, I mean, we have a lot of these kind of things now as well. Um, for instance, like in Copenhagen, a few years ago, there was a uh, there's a, a new place called Primer, where it's a, a kind of a, a biotech lab, I guess. I mean, they're mostly looking at kind of water filtration and, and bacteria, um, but they have like a, a, a artist residency thing. And um, I, I've, I've yet to see any artworks come out of there that were really engaging with the institution or making the institution shift. But I think for the, 
uh, for the people who actually work there, it's kind of nice to have like a weirdo in the room who's an artist. I mean, that's the imagination of this kind of seamless kind of placement and, and uh, relationships with artists. Um, you know, I mean, the whole the whole kind of point is 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 the idea that the institution could literally and figuratively support the artist. And you know, of course, the the best example of this is is the Viennese collective Gelatin, where in in the year two thousand, like less, just over a year before um, before nine eleven happened, um, many of you might not know this, but the World Trade Center had an artist residency space. Um, it was it was on like the 91st floor. And so there was like the entire floor was artist studios for years um, since I think the 80s or something. And so these guys, they they did this residency and what they did was they just totally blocked off their studio. And people thought that they that that was like their kind of artwork and their, their thing. But what was actually happening was that they were building a cantilevered uh, support <laughs> where they um, went out and stood on the 91st floor of the World Trade Center. Um, you know, so in, in, in this case, you, you get, you know, he, here, you know, I mean, it's, it's interesting because it's not that they're, it's like they're really taking the institution at its word by saying like, okay, if you want to support artists, you can physically support artists. Here we go. And, and in this case, it's, it's very much about kind of, um, you know, how how to how to uh, like in what way can the parasite kind of take place it can rupture the kind of sovereignty of the host domain and and kind of turn this kind of the host hospitality to hostility by kind of confusing and occupying this this space between outside and inside um a more kind of modest approach recently would be pilvi takala's recent work the stroker and in this she was like um it, she, she posed as a wellness consultant named Nina Nierman, the founder of a cutting gauge company called Personal Touch. And she went into one of these kind of um, uh, one of these kind of uh, open workspaces called Second Home. And she she was providing a service to them by um, touching everybody in the in the workplace. And so she would like go around and and just like, you know, just just kind of caress them. And um, of course, it made people very uncomfortable and they were talking and how people negotiated that was also part of that. But um, she ended up being called the stroker, which is why she she calls the work the stroker. Um, you know, so so you have a lot of these type of, you know, she in this case, she's she's taking an open system and kind of um, masquerading as providing a kind of service and then using that for a brief period of time to be able to extract value. And while at the same time also testing people's responses to a kind of um, a, a, a very modest shift in behavior, which then makes makes everybody else's behavior change around it, a very kind of parasitical kind of system. Um, you know, another, uh, you know, another perfect ex uh, example of this type of kind of mimicry that 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 is happening uh, in this is uh, Joe Magid, who we will talk to, I think, on the fourth session, fourth session. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. Um, and, and Jill Magid also has this kind of, um, you know, I, 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 I thought going from to call it to, uh, to Magid made, made sense because um, Magid also always kind of, you know, she, she, she always kind of comes in very um, straightforward to institutions, but it tries to kind of develop um, a kind of almost intimate relationship with them. I mean, in this case, she she came to a kind of security firm that had all these kind of um, uh, uh, all these uh, CCTV cameras all throughout um, Amsterdam, the the police department. And so what she was doing was what she she came to them and was like, "Hey, why don't we make this more pretty?" Um, I'll, I'll I'll kind of ornament them and and and, and beautify them. And so they're them being confused about an artist. Let let her kind of go ahead and do this. Um, probably one of her m most um, powerful works was her work um, Evidence Locker, where she where she also took the kind of logic of public surveillance and the police um, um, at its kind of at its words. So she went around in Liverpool for thirty one days, apparently. There, there's a law that the um, that CCTV cam a camera footage has to be erased every 31 days. So this is what, so she she kind of used that as a kind of marker for a thing, 
And so what, what she did was that she would wear this bright red trench coat and then she would call the police on duty with details of where she was. And then she'd ask them to like zoom in on her and film her. And um, in the end, she had to apply for a, um, like she had to submit like 31 subject access request forms because apparently in, in UK law that you can, you through legal documents, you can actually get um, uh, images of yourself if you, if you demand it and identify it. Um, and so she, she went through uh, this whole thing, but the way that she communicated to the police was by sending a kind of love letter to them, um, expressing how she was feeling and what she was thinking. And, and each one of these, she wanted to kind of, um, she, she saw this kind of project as a kind of intimate portrait of the relationship between herself and the police and the city as, as this thing. So she's using a kind of already existing apparatus and this kind of power structure to be able to, to do this. Um, the one of the works that she wants um, you guys to look at within our within our talk will uh, within her, her talk is is called Lincoln Ocean Victor Eddy and in this um, it was quite simple kind of project where where um, you know in, in 2007 where you had a stop and frisk in in New York um, there there were she heard on the PA that said that um, it informed everyone that any passenger may be subject to a search. So what she for security reasons. So what she did was she came to a police officer and asked him to search her and she would like persistently come to the police and demand that they they search her. So she's constantly kind of testing this relationship of power, but also the kind of intimacy of institutions. It's like it's not just that the institutions are kind of forming our, our bodies and our, our behavior and our, and our access, but it's also that we that, that we have this kind of shared co-evolution together and that we are like, we are so dependent on these things that it becomes like a lover in this, in this sense. You, be, you become kind of uh, intimately implicated into the actions. Um, possibly her most famous work is what she calls the spy project. And in this case, um, the Dutch secret service in 2005, um, uh, because they were building a new building, they, they, uh, there's, there's laws in the Netherlands that say that a certain portion of their stuff has to be spent on an art uh, art commission for for any new building, and so what um, at the time the Dutch Secret Service solicited um, uh, you know they, they wanted to to provide the the um, the Secret Service the Avon uh, Ivan with a human face. And so what she did was for, for over three years, I mean, she's like a, a super hardcore researcher um, and she'll go, she'll go through every bureaucratic maneuver. I mean, there's not a lot of artists that will go all the way through, through these kind of things and, and be willing to do it, but she got vetted and then was allowed to meet um, clandestinely with um, uh, different spies. And she wasn't allowed to use uh, recording equipment, but she took lots of notes. And um, eventually she kind of developed a kind of, um, you know, a, a, a series of kind of stories and materials associated with the employees. And then, you know, of course, because it, it's like Secret Service stuff, she had to like then give it to the Secret Service and the Secret Service determine what was allowed and what was not. So this is showing some of the uh, um, censorship that that these documents ended up happening. So after this entire kind of range of censorship and over three years of playing with the, uh, the Dutch Secret Service, she ended up um, she ended up doing a, sh uh, a show of this and they came in and they even confiscated more of these articles. And then even after trying to use this kind of like she at one point she um, she did a, she did a, a show at the Tate Modern and she she included the real report that she had written of, of all, of, all of these kind of different interviews with, with spies. And, um, and she put it behind uh, securely behind security glass. So nobody could read it. But even then the secret service agency came to the Tate Martin, walked in and took it. And just right like that, no bureaucratic anything. They were like, that is ours, give it. And they took it back. Um, and it created this entire kind of thing because because it's like she's collaborated with them, she's 
been in this kind of relationship with them for many years at this point. And then at, at different times, you know, what type of information is allowed and not is constantly, constantly shifting. And so this is, this is something that you can only get if you enter in as a parasite within such a, uh, such a um, arcane and complex institution and, and really kind of test out every possibility that happens in there. Um, in a more kind of recent uh, thing, she, she got in a lot of trouble because um, uh, this, like the kind of god architect of Mexico, Luis Barragan, modernist architect of Mexico, Luis Barragan. Um, um, one thing that she found, uh, what Jill Magid found out was that, that uh, Barragan has this like massive personal archive, but all of his professional archive is owned by Vitra, this furniture company who has a big archive in, um, in Switzerland. And she was she was trying to kind of um, figure out how can we repatriate this archive or at least have access to it um, in Mexico. Um, and so she was in contact with uh, lots of Barragan's family and other people. And at one point, they decided to exhume the architect's remains and get get his dead body and turn it into a diamond, which you see right here. <laughs> and then they tried to auction off the diamond to be able to pay to buy the, uh, the archive back. And this became a huge media sensation because, um, you know, people were le legitimately mad about the exhumation of this kind of uh, saint of, of Mexican modernist architecture, but also that, that, um, that it would, would be kind of encoded in all these kind of different um, exchanges and particularly this kind of logic of national identity and repatriation. One, what the, um, the, and th this has happened a number of times, but one of the reasons, uh, th these type of dysfunctions happen quite a bit, but one of the reasons why the Vitra is not, was not willing to repatriate the Barragan um, professional archives was because um, Switzerland and Mexico already have a dispute about certain museological artifacts and to repatriate something would be to then to acknowledge all these other kind of colonial disputes between the the ownership of the uh, uh, and the patronage of these different works so it um it brings up all these troubles up I, I i think it'd be interesting to find out like what 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 happened to this ring and, and and how the kind of project ended up but it was um yeah quite a quite a heavy level project um and then of course uh, i think i think she will certainly talk about this but like you know her most recent project was in response to to COVID and what she did was as a kind of parody of the, the $1,200 stimulus checks that were issued to, to people under the CARES Act, she minted uh, 120,000 pennies and had them um, engraved with a, uh, on the edge to, that says the body was already so fragile. And, and one thing that you should also know is that copper is um, antimicrobial. So, um, Pennies don't 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 share um, like you can't get a virus from from a penny in that sense, um, and and so what she did was uh, she circulated these out and so these have um, these these pennies are now all over New York and now um, I guess uh, assumedly all over the U S. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to hear uh, hear this because as I understand, she's also done a movie related to this and has done a number of other kind of artifacts related to to the kind of tender project so it would be i'd be curious to see kind of what what that could be um you know we're, we're almost done guys I'm, I'm i'm really sorry for just going on forever um you know um an, another one of our guests will be golden uh, actually our first guest will be a duo called uh golden Senebi, uh based in stockholm and um you know, since 2004, the work has explored the structural correspondence between conceptual art and finance capital. And, and I mean, it's not just that, but that was a, that was a big part of their project. And, and one of the, one of the kind of beginnings of this was this, um, headless, um, essentially the artists and, and, and I could totally understand this, the, the, the artists were, were looking around for information around, um, uh, George Bataille's, 
uh, nihilistic uh, Nietzschean society, a uh, secret Nietzschean society that was called acephaly. Um, they, they were searching for headless. And what they ended up finding out was that there was a real Bahamas based offshore corporation that was called headless limited. And so they then in order to, to, to kind of figure this out, they hired a detective and then a novelist and then a, a, uh, a legal analyst and a filmmaker and all these different people to try to kind of like fit, they kind of audit, they, they did essentially like an offshore experience of developing a kind of book of a kind of detective story of people essentially investigating themselves and finding themselves within this kind of mush that was re that was following the real flows of offshore finance corporations. So going back from the Bahamas to Switzerland to some other random uh, place, and so they were they were playing with all the kind of different ways that corporations use offshore subsidiaries to circumvent taxes and and regulations, and then kind of use that to kind of continuously displace their own um, artistic position. Um, so um, for them, they they've they've for for the class they've given the book which i would really recommend reading but um if not if you don't have time to read a whole weird detective story um i i, I would recommend um I'll, I'll i'll post some links to some really good uh essays about this project that is that is worth um taking a look at and thinking about because i think it's really interesting and they they kind of like followed this up i mean they they were doing this for um yeah, for a long time. I, I, I'm not even sure if the project is actually over. That that would be an interesting question for them. Um, you know, and they did some other kind of things. They 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 developed a magic trick um, for financial markets. And so what they what they did is they also spent um, another three years infiltrating a kind of secretive hedge fund, and and they kind of tried to kind of use they tried to reverse engineer the kind of these. Um, these short selling kind of practices. And so then they they used, in collaboration with a stage mu magician, they would kind of use the kind of mechanisms that you would, that would be generally used within the market and would be these kind of impalpable kind of betting on the loss of, of you know, short selling and of all these different commodities and use that as a way to generate a kind of uh, magical routine and, and, and treat, teaching a kind of real magic trick that also is a is a financial instrument in that sense. Um, one of the most uh, positive kind of things that they've done was that um, they they proposed for um, a train station in in Gothenburg, Sweden. Um, rather than to like produce a you know they were asking for a commission for a new sculpture or something, and they just said do eternal employment. And so what they did, what uh, what they will do is that, because uh, I think it starts in 2026, is that they, um, they've they now got this uh, city and funder to commit to paying somebody a living wage for forever <laughs> to just stand around and do whatever they want in um, in this space. So every day the person needs to come in, check in and check out, but um, otherwise, they just they do whatever they want um, within the space. And um, also, I, I think this will play a big role in their kind of presentation. And th they're going to give a kind of lecture performance. But um, one one of them has been um, uh, you know living with with uh, autoimmune disease um, MS, I think, uh, muscular cirrhosis, and um, and and um, that's become like a fundamental part of their kind of project in the last years. So um, the, cur currently they're kind of de de developing also another kind of fiction, another kind of novel with a kind of um, that that is kind of using a kind of autoimmune like logics of autoimmunity and of, of contamination and 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 support and the body and and um, 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 interspecies uh, relationships to generate a kind of another form of fiction. Um, yeah, so it, it'll be interesting to see and to hear from them because um, it's I, I think it's interesting that that um, they've gone from the kind of impalpable world of financial capitalism to to now kind of um, now now really addressing themselves and their own body, which has always kind of functioned as a kind of um, 
as an immaterial kind of just a, like a law, a law firm, Golden and Senebi. So um, yeah, it'll be really fascinating to hear from them. And that'll be our first one. Um, our last talk will be with uh, Yannick Simon. Um, I live in Poland, so um, I'm, I'm not Polish, but I, but I live here. But he's he's a, a Polish artist, very very interesting guy. Um, he I'm not sure what he will end up talking about, but I imagine that it it'll come from his recent projects um, related to a, a, a big monographic exhibition that he did called Synthetic Folklore. But you know his his whole kind of mentality has been about like he he's a kind of diy hacker tinkerer anarchist who will you uh who will often kind of um um re reverse engineer different technologies to then be able to do kind of um um different works and and often it involves kind of the visualizations based off of like statistical data so so this is just a simple one of of um you know so, um this is like mapping out some relationships in the transatlantic uh, um, uh, trade, uh, transatlantic, the history of transatlantic trade. Um, you know, this is a visualization of the Polish economy. And actually in this exhibition, he had another one that was, that was also a visualization of the exhibitions of budget. So you, you have like this kind of real kind of comparison. Um, but m the parasitical aspect of, of Yannick Simon's work is very much about how he will often um, use, um, he will also uh, often use or refer to different kind of logics of, of knockoffs, of copyright infringements, and hack technologies. And he'll use these kind of parasitical forms or relate to them to be able to kind of um, uh, uh, to see how information circulates through different economies and different cultures in this case. Often it's about kind of cultural, what, what might be perceived as one kind of form of cultural property being kind of moved and exported and, 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 and changing as, it, as it's going through these different flows. And so he's very much playing with these type of, uh, of aspects. Um, yeah, I, I I see that now we're running out of time, but yeah, I'm 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 almost done. <laughs> this is the last last thing. So it's like you know, in this in this case, this was a Polish imitation of 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 the Monopoly game, and um, you know, this was also uh, th this was a kind of attempt within the um, with w within the uh, uh, within the Polish economy to kind of try to relate to the actual original monopoly, which originally monopoly was about showing how horrible capitalism and monopolies and market dominance are, but ended up being actually like a celebration of this, obviously. Um, you know, this is a Chinese cal uh, calculator that he, he, he reverse engineered. Apparently there was, there was a number of news stories that were, um, where, where, um, uh, different people were hacking, um, uh, hacking uh, calculators because like in, in certain exchanges you would just like type out these things and then you, and and so they were hacking it so that would um, increase the results by seven percent so it's using these type of logics and, and mentalities um, I mean he's very much a storyteller I mean he he did I mean he'd be embarrassed that I'm I'm mentioning this piece but this is a very old work of his but 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 I um, I've always enjoyed this that that he went into a store and bought a can of coke and then he went into another store and brought the same can of Coke to, up to the thing and they scanned it and he bought it and then he bought it again and he bought it again and he bought it again. So he's, it, it's kind of the, the reverse of kind of, um, of, of, of stealing in this sense, but also like, like showing how the same object has these different values and also how like the same object can have value added to it without anything ever changing, um, which is a very parasitical gesture. Um, and he's often hacking kind of algorithmic and surveillance technologies, which I think is also um, integral to his practice. And um, yeah, I mean, what, but one of my kind of fa favorite kind of projects is like, like I, I talked about like kind of cultural, cultural ownership and identity. What, what um, for, for many years, he's been trying to develop um, a Nollywood version of this canonical Polish film, Ashes and Diamonds. Um, and it itself is an interesting movie because it is very much about the kind of, um, about the kind of, uh, um, the, you know, it's very, very much about the coal industry in, in Poland and, and also the history of kind of slavery and, 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 and work within, uh, within the context of, of the economic system here. But, but, um, you know, 
he he he's been trying to take this kind of canonical image that is used that that is kind of like infallible within the Polish context and bring it to Nollywood, where where Nollywood has its own codes and 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 um, uh, directions. So um, he has a director, as I understand, and and some other people who are already um, developing the the script in in Nigeria. And so um, the plan is to do a kind of Nollywood version of this. Um, la last artist. So so. Um, Chris Evans, we will be talking with on, yeah, Chris Evans will be the sixth um, uh, discussion. And Chris Evans is super interesting because he's also really, um, he's really thinking around kind of ethics in relationship to these kind of parasitical practices. And, you know, um, really fundamental to his work is, is about kind of creating these conversations with between different kind of systems and different kind of um, people from different um, roles in in the world, but also different economic systems, different stakeholders, and bringing them together and seeing seeing kind of what could happen out of that. So in this case, this is a number of, of sculptures that were developed with um, uh, these special cattle who licked them, and then they were casted. Um, often his is kind of also a form of kind of radical um, interest or complicity or um some some level of trying to kind of find a way where um where a kind of renegotiation of beliefs and social status and ideological positions can be kind of um staged through the exhibition um in this case like he these these are a series of cityscapes that are that are from the vantage point of office windows of insurance companies so um He's often finding these different collaborators, inviting them to 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 help him out on these different things. Probably his most difficult and most notor uh, one, uh, most notorious work, which I think he will talk about in, in the class, so I won't go too far into it. But he wanted to rebrand this um this the 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 oldest um um so socialist communist um uh, daily in in the UK. It's called the Morning Star. And one thing that he was pointing out was that you know if you if you look at like a new uh, at, at a um, at a newsstand, it looks the same as all these other weekly tabloids, all the uh, uh, daily tabloids like the Sun, the Daily Mirror, uh, or the Daily Star and stuff. And it looks like the Morning Star, and so people don't really know that it has all this kind of ideological and historical kind of weight behind it, much less its own kind of mentality. So for like something, it's it's something like twenty or thirty years. He's been trying to rebrand this this um, this newspaper to kind of give it a new look that also would integrate the kind of um, the 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 design logics that would be much closer to the way that these people actually think and uh, and are working. Um, so after after decades, he finally asks again. Uh, um, and they say yes, we we'd be interested in this. And so he started working on this with with um, these designers, Dexter Sinister, and and a number of other people. And they were they were um, developing it for an exhibition at the showroom in London. And um, once the uh, publicity material had been sent out, all of a sudden the the newspaper quit because the uh, the newspaper was like. Hey, there's like corporate logos and other supporters of this institution. That's totally not what we're doing, and 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 so it it was it was this kind of failed collaboration that that happened here. And all of a sudden, you have like these different types of systems where you know these guys might be very radical in their politics, but their design is totally antiquated and conservative, you know, and and is like mimicking the same logic of of, of conservatives, and you know, like so so it's it's this kind of earnest kind of. A, Chris Evans's work is very much about these kind of earnest attempts to kind of make things better by putting them together and see see if these different systems can be able to work work well together and 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 fix each other. But sometimes it doesn't happen. So um, yeah, that's a good example. And 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 just to kind of finish it off, um, yeah, he'll he'll talk about this piece a little bit, um, which is quite a bit more complicated. But um, you know, I mean. What what I know Chris Evans from uh, the most was that for for like, I mean he's done this dozens of times where um, all over the world is that what he does is it's it's a project called Cop Talk 
and he invites representatives from national police forces to give recruitment presentations at art academies. So, I mean, at and and at art schools, I mean, like uh, it's it's an inter- it's an interesting premise, you know. I mean, I think um, I, I think of all schools in the world, you would uh, not expect a bunch of artists to be interested in joining the police force, and um, for sure, it's a weird thing, but it but it generates these very interesting discussions um, where the cops are forced to to think aesthetically and creatively about their own practice while at the same time the artists have to all of a sudden reappraise what what is what is the policeman and what is what is this power and what is this kind of roles and what what kind of role could i have so in many ways it's both kind of parasitical by like bumping these two systems together or like exchanging one system with another but it's also a matter of um uh potentially creating a bunch of uh infiltrations of art school graduates going into the into the police forces so yeah um so that's kind of that's that's kind of the end of 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 my long-winded presentation i'm sorry that i i wasn't more um uh, um yeah faster with this but um but i i just like to say um so so is that I, I imagine that most of you guys have been part of of the new center or have done a, n- a number of these things, but as I, uh, but this is all kind of new to me. But as far as I understand it, um, for every one of these classes, for every one of these presentations, um, y- you and and a couple other people will sign up to give a response to the works and texts that are proposed by the artists, and I'll. I'll organize all of this stuff um, later today and tomorrow. It'll all all be there and and very clearly written and and so so you'll you know what you're looking at. But I would I would suggest like kind of thinking about which artist would be interesting for you to respond to, and then in these kind of things, just prepare like a, a ten to fifteen minute um, uh, reflection or analysis or reading of um, the artwork that is proposed by the artist or the um, text that they propose or something maybe related to their presentation, although that presentation will literally happen right before. So prepare a bit. Um, I really see these, um, I'm, I'm not sure how they normally work, but but um, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing them less as like a summary of what you've read and more of trying to kind of place it in context and place it maybe also in context with your own research interests. and. Um, you know, I mean, the the point of it is to have a conversation starter because this artist is going to do do a, uh, these artists are going to um, you know uh, going to give us a wonderful lecture and then um, it shouldn't just be a conversation with me. It'd be great to have some people come in um, with some um, prepared research to ref, uh, re- reflect and respond to the artist and kind of start the conversation um, so that we have a kind of lively discussion. Um, maybe maybe your entire presentation is to question the entire mentality of this artist or whether or not it f- uh, fits in as a parasitical enterprise or if you find that things are are problematic or like someone like um you know i i i mentioned that minerva Cuevas, i imagine will i i know that the text that she has proposed are, are very um very much about kind of decolonialize uh decolonial kind of discourses and and uh, also placing within um e- ecological crises but all but um you know she also talks quite a bit about the difference between um works that happen in a gallery and works that happen in in the real world and the difference between you know works that are political versus political actions that are works <laughs> so um you know like try to kind of build those type of relate try to think about those type of questions and 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 gravitate to to all of them um so there'll be a sign up sheet on the classrooms i guess that that um that everybody could just uh, please like um sometime in the next few days just uh throw your name down otherwise we'll just start assigning it and that's that's no fun um for other uh, other people who who are taking this as a as a class for for course credit there is also a written assignment um and the written assignment is is quite simple and it's it's um and it's it's really quite open ended and we can talk about it if you would like um but the basic uh, the basic thing is um is to either d- develop a 
to write a short proposal, you know, a couple pages, whatever is uh, makes sense and is appropriate to get the point across, but develop a proposal for either a parasitical artwork or an exhibition featuring parasitical strategies. Um, with that exhibition, it'd be great if you could include one or more of the artists um, who we will be speaking with. Um, if neither of these are your cup of tea and are you more somebody who's more interested in analyses, I'd be really curious also if um, if anybody wants to to develop like a kind of comparison and contrast between one form of strategy or another, or whether or not one kind of form of parasitism you find is really volatile and necessary and another one isn't, or, um, you know, maybe trying to kind of think around some of these questions of complicity of what happens when a, a parasite gets incorporated into the institution. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll write a, a very clear kind of statement about these things, but it, it, it'd be good just to begin to think about what you could propose and, and, and do. Um, and it's, it's quite simple. So it's not, it's not, a, it shouldn't be very heavy. Um, so yeah, so is there any other questions or, or concerns? Um, sorry, I've kind of just talked everybody's ears off. Um, I imagine for some of you, it's like really early in the morning. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> or late at night, I guess. Um, okay, well, um, if this, I mean, it's, I don't yet really know how this works. Oh, great. Oh, I, I have not been paying attention to this to this chat at all, but this looks fantastic. I'm 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 gonna save all of this. Um yeah. Uh yeah. Super. I don't know. Um so please, like let's um you guys now have all my uh have my email. Um please just uh give me give me a day or two to fill in um the classrooms and the, the assignments and to also reorganize because some of the artists have sent random pieces of what they want to present, so I just need to to organize it together, and um, then you'll have everything at, on your plate. And um, and please just let me know if you have any questions. And uh, thanks for letting me talk your ears off. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank cool. you.